Good afternoon. We're about to start the Committee of the Whole meeting on Tuesday, March 7th, 2023. Just want to call the meeting to order. Welcome everyone to the Committee of the Whole meeting. Just a reminder that this is the Committee of the Whole and no decisions will be made here today. There will only be recommendations that will go to our next regular council meeting on Tuesday, March 21st, 2023 for consideration. And on that note, I just want to do a little bit of a, an introduction and recognize that tomorrow, March 8th, is the International Women's Day for 2023, where every woman counts. The global theme this year is Embrace Equity. It's a reminder that all women from all ages and walks of life have a place in every aspect in our society today. Equality means each individual or group of people is given the same resources and opportunities. Equity recognizes that each person has a different circumstance and allocates that exact resources and opportunities needed to reach that outcome. Tomorrow, we absorb, observe in support of taking action against gender inequality around the world. Tomorrow, I challenge you, take a moment, acknowledge all the amazing, awesome women in your life. Talk to the young girls in your life, recognize that there are differences out there and their values are, and opinions are very much celebrated. Let them know that sky has no limits and to keep reaching for those stars. It's really nice to be sitting where I am today because I get to acknowledge all the, the women leadership sitting in this room, recognizing all our city staff across the city of Cortha Lakes, and recognizing our community leaders, our business leaders, and our community champions. And then to delve back in and recognize my own family and my own social circles. And I want to say thank you for always being there supporting me and you. I think a lot of things that have to be said is to celebrate women's successes around the city of Kawartha Lakes. Equality is a goal, and equity means to get there, and how we do that in the city of Kawartha Lakes. We've made leaps and bounds in the last numerous years, and we continue to, sur sur to surpass those expectations, and we're here to applaud, to encourage, and to support all the women across the city of Kawartha Lakes. So today, let's continue supporting each other every single day. And today, let's support tomorrow. So thank you. All right. So we'll call the to order. And a, do, can I have a first and seconder for the adoption of the agenda, please? Councillor Warren, second by De, uh, Mayor Helmsley. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, do we have any disclosure of pecuniary interest today? I see none. Let, oh, oh, we need a vote for that adoption of the agenda. Great. Thank you. All in favor? And so proved. We'll move into deputations. Uh, excuse me, Ms. Deputy Mayor, I have a declaration. Okay, go ahead. Item, item 7.6 on the agenda. Thank you, Councillor Yo. In what way? In what way? Um, uh, the sibling is one of the purchasers. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll move into deputations. Uh, number 4.1, proposed surplus declaration closure and sale of a portion of road allowance between 447 and 451 Cambrai Road. Uh, we have uh, Kelly Shazwell online to do this deputation. Just a reminder that you have five minutes and at the end of your five minutes, if uh, the council members have questions for you, we can address them at that time. So go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Kelly Shelswell, and my address is 8 Greenshields Crescent, Oral Medante, Ontario, L0L1T0. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to the committee today. I'm here representing Stephen and Loretta Harrison, the owners of 451 Cambry Road, in regards to the proposal to purchase a fair split of the road allowance with the adjacent property owners at 447 Cambry Road. Uh, it's being proposed and presented to you today for consideration to go on to the next council meeting, and we like to support that decision. I just wanted to also provide a little bit of background uh, information and history on how we arrived here today and how uh, you're looking at the proposal in front of you. Um, in 2016, when the home was purchased, we commissioned a surveyor to establish the lot lines. At that time, the owners at 447 had occupied the majority of the road allowance and were encroaching also onto the side yard of 451 Cambry. We had those things rectified and the items were removed. 
In 2018, uh, Mr. Harrison approached the city uh, to inquire about the purchase of the road allowance uh, in question today. We were told it had not yet been surplused, and if it was, it would be sold at a 50-50 split between both parties as per policy and guidelines. In July of 2022, the Harrisons received a letter from Realty Services outlining the split as per a map provided. However, the map provided was a 75-25 split in favour of 447 Cambry, uh, but it was noted that the costs the Harrisons were to cover were 50% of the transaction costs. They reached out to Realty Services in mid-July, were told that all we are proposing to sell you is the portion outlined on the map. The remainder would be sold to 447 Cambry Road. Please also note the proposal to sell the road allowance does require council approval. They received no explanation or option to counter the proposal at this time. We're a little confused. They reached out to me, they're my in-laws, and asked me to look it over. I've worked in the construction and land development sector for 15 years. With the bylaws and policies in place, we didn't understand why we were only hearing of the sale in July when it was originally proposed in March and why it wasn't a 50-50 split. We reached back out to Laura and confirmed we could submit a counter proposal and further confirmed there was not, nor had there ever been an encroachment agreement with the owners at 447 for the items on the road allowance. We then submitted our counter proposal in October, requesting a fair even split by two approaches. The first being a center line divide, which created a balance in the total land acquired by both parties. However, from a surveying and planning standpoint, option two, which was to split the front frontage and line up the angled dividing line as shown on the map with the existing rear property lines made more sense. This option afforded 447 approximately 300 square feet extra, but we agreed to 50-50 split the cost as you're seeing. An additional request was that a privacy fence be constructed after the transaction completed at a 50-50 cost split as well with both parties. Up until the last three years, the relationship between both neighbors has been quite amicable, but it's taken a turn for the worse. There's been some bylaw issues, issues with off-leash dogs, and we just wanna make sure everyone gets back to enjoying their property. I would like to see the committee approve obviously a fair split of this property and purchase between both properties and for the matter to proceed to council for final review and approval. We understand that 447 will counter here today and request to revert back to their original proposal for more land, which would allow them to keep their items on the road allowance. However, none of these items are permanent in nature that could or should not be removed. We're not sure why standard policy and best practices would be deviated in this case, and we hope they aren't. Should 447 rescind their offer, we would like the offer to be extended to us to purchase the road allowance in its entirety. Thank you, I won't take up any more of your time, but I'm happy to answer any further questions. Thank you very much for that deputation. Is there any questions at this time from council members? Okay, can I have a first and second to uh, receive the report, the deputation? Councillor Perry, Councillor Ashmore, all in favor? And that's approved, thank you. We'll move on to deputation 4.2, proposed surplus declaration closure and sale a portion of road allowance between 447 and 451 Cambrai Road. We have Kevin Duguay online. Just a reminder, you have the five minutes, thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, I'd like to start, if I can, for those uh, city council members that may uh, or have been familiar with uh, former Mayor Jack Doris, who passed away uh, at age of 92 yesterday. Um, he was a, a mentor and a friend, and I just wanted to let uh, your city council know of uh, Mayor Doris' uh, passing. He spent 42 years on City of Peterborough Council. Now, with respect to um, the uh, matter at hand, the proposed acquisition of a uh, unopened city road allowance. The the matter was initiated by my client, Ms. Watson, who joined me today. She's sitting on my on my right. She worked closely with municipal staff. She paid the requisite fee, followed the requisite process, and it's it was understood during said process that a neighbor, the neighboring property would ultimately be uh, circulated and made aware of. The, the interest of Ms. Watson to acquire a portion of the road allowance. So that, that matter started with the Watson household. And fundamentally, what it was attempting to do was acquire lands that have been enjoyed, not only by the Watson family, but by the previous property owner over several years. And some of these lands 
uh, or these lands are within the unopened road allowance. And admittedly, there would not be encroachment agreements uh, assigned to some of the semi-permanent features within that road allowance. And that is not unusual throughout your municipality nor throughout Central East Ontario. So the initial uh, proposal that was submitted by um, Ms. Watson um, showed a preferred approach. Subsequently, the um, adjacent property owner, uh, they, they uh, Harrison, uh, counter with a different proposal. The proposal, if it were to implement the road allowance purchase in, involving a 50-50 split, which in principle is the standard practice, but it's not always the outcome of road allowance purchases. I'm involved with several throughout Peterborough County, and it's not always a 50-50 split. In this case, the 50-50 split as proposed fails to recognize a long established enjoyment of a portion of a city uh, unopened road allowance by the Watson family and a previous property owner. It would mean that raised garden beds and other amenity features would have to be moved. Uh, Ms. Sheswell, in her deputation, um, Madam Deputy Mayor, uh, committee members indicated the notion of a privacy board fence. This is not information that was shared with Ms. Watson or myself. And I believe that may be a matter that is um, uh, an uh, interest of the Harrison family only and not necessarily forming part of any um, acquisition of land. We are also been aware of uh, a complaint that was made regarding one dog uh, owned by Ms. Watson uh, that would have enjoyed or attempted to enjoy what it thought was its backyard, that is a portion of the road allowance. That matter is being addressed. And frankly, that is a very minor um, a matter that is being uh, addressed now in a responsible manner. From my perspective as a professional land use planner who has been working, who works with such matters and has over 40 years, or excuse me, 35 years, the principle of an equitable split of property in principle is often the desired approach, but in this case is not the appropriate solution. What you will end up with is creating, I will describe as friction between two property owners. And it would be appropriate to consider in this instance, a different configuration of land, bearing in mind that it was Ms. Watson who initiated this process to acquire. And she paid the requisite fee to pay for a purchase of a part of a city open, on open road allowance. And that's the important principle. That's where this process started. I make myself available, um, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, our council members, in the event that there should be uh, any questions. I also am aware that the Deputy Clerk was kind enough, Sarah, to circulate to you uh, materials that I had provided to Realty Services and your clerks, the clerk's office in advance of this meeting. Again, I make myself available as well. Ms. Watson joins me in the event there are questions. Thank you for uh, receiving our deputation. Thank you very much for coming today. And if we have questions, I see Councillor McDonald with his hand up. Go ahead. Uh, yes, if, if you aren't suggesting a 50-50, what kind of a split are you asking for? Yes, uh, Councillor uh, McDonald, um, it would be it would be similar to 50-50. It might end up being somewhere around uh, maybe a 60-40. Essentially, what we would like to see is that line just has to be shifted over a bit closer to the adjacent property, the uh, Harrison property, so that Ms. Watson would not have to be moving uh, some of her established raised beds and rear yard amenity space. So it's not a significant change. And um, we, we certainly would be happy to furnish that uh, proposal map schedule directly to staff following the council's meet this, this committee, the whole meeting. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next question, we have uh, Mayor Amsley. No, nope, you don't, you took it off. Okay, uh, Councillor Perry, please. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And uh, thank you for the, the presentation this afternoon. Uh, I was out Sunday afternoon to get eyes on this, this lot and talk to both of the neighbors. They were both home, coincidentally, which was good. Um, I just had a question 
the uh, representative for the, the neighbors had mentioned a possible 300, uh, was it meter? No, it couldn't have been 300 meters, but a 300 foot, I guess, uh, compromise potentially, a third way here. Could you provide a little more detail on you know, what that proposal is? Uh, yes, that was Councillor Perry, correct? That's right. Hey, thank you, and I th thank you, sir, for uh, uh, attending the property. Ms. Watson did inform me of your attendance. So thank you, sir. Um, I, I, I can't speak uh, with any assuredness um, the additional 300 square feet that may be involved, but I believe if I may describe matters as I see it, is that a 50-50 equitable split in this case is um, really challenges the original intention of Ms. Watson. And I, I see an opportunity, sir, through, through Madam Chair, perhaps for a, a modest reconfiguration of the property where Ms. Watson's family's interests are met and that of the adjacent property owner. Uh, and it may involve that one property owner ultimately ends up sl acquiring slightly more land and would be, should be paying for that additional land um, acquisition. Thank you. You just answered my second question about the allotment of the payment, uh, should it, regardless of which solution is chosen. I think we have a Wisdom of Solomon type decision on our hands here. So uh, thank you for all the information uh, to help us decide. You're quite welcome. Thank you. And if there's no other questions at this time. Okay, uh, that the deputation of Kevin Dungay regarding the proposed surplus declaration closure and sale of a portion of road allowance between 447 and 451 Cambrai Road be received and that this recommendation be brought forward to council for consideration at the next council meeting. Can I have a first and second? Councillor Perry, second. Councillor Smeaton, and passed. I just also want to remind that deputations 4.1, 4.2, we do have a relating item on the agenda 7.4 coming up later. So thank you. We'll move on to uh, deputation 4.3, request for relief for the high water bill for the Woodville Medical Center. Andrew Vale, go ahead. Five good minutes, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Deputy Mayor, Mr. Mayor, Council. Um, I'm speaking to you the, uh, this afternoon as a director of the Woodville Medical Center. The Woodville Medical Center is a nonprofit medical trust that was established in the early 70s um, by uh, community members of the village of Woodville. Um, in August of 2022, we received a water bill in the amount of $424. Um, and at that time, just to put it in perspective, in 2021, our entire year's water bill was $452. Um, so we, uh, we checked the uh, facility. We couldn't find, uh, any leaks anywhere, uh, taps, toilets, anything like that. Um, at that time, we reached out, um, one of the other directors reached out to, uh, the city. Um, and the city was very helpful. They recommended that we try a uh, dye test, which we did, uh, which uh, <clears throat> found that one of the uh, toilets was was in fact leaking. Um, so as soon as we uh, did found that, we uh, shut the water off to to that toilet and replaced the toilet. Um, but in that time frame, the subsequent bill that came following uh, the August bill in uh, November, the amount was $1,388. <clears throat> so effectively, uh, um, we're seeking relief for um, the approximate $1,800, $1,900 in, in, um, in water bill that we had, uh, accrued over that period of time. Thank you. And is there any questions for the deputant? Uh, we have uh, Mayor Emsley. Thank you, Mr. Vale, for your presentation. Uh, they did not really receive any relief from the first water bill of four hundred and fifty-one dollars, or whatever it was. We we received no relief from either of the water bills. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Joyce. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, and through you. 
Um, Mr. Vale, uh, that center is not being used at the moment. Am I correct in that, that it's vacant? No, oh, that's incorrect. The facility is being used. There is a nurse practitioner that's there. It's on a part-time basis currently, but uh, that facility is being used and it was being used at the time. Okay. And what kind of relief are you looking for? That's totally up to council. <clears throat> okay, just curious what you had in mind. Um, pardon? Okay, over to... I believe I believe in the past how it was, it's always been looked at in the past is they've taken an average of, of the water bill and, and uh, forgiven uh, anything over and above what the average would be. And what does council want to do? Mayor Elmsley. Um, Madam Chair, uh, if if you're agreeable, uh, I think we received this, and then I would have a I would make a motion that it be referred to staff for a report back um, as soon as they can. Thank you. Do we have a first, a seconder on that? Councillor Ashmore. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. All in favor? <laughs> and that's passed. So, Madam Chair, I would uh, make a motion. Uh, I know we don't make motions at Committee of the Whole, but I would recommend that this be forwarded to staff for a report back as soon as they could get one on providing uh, on what we could do to provide relief for uh, the medical center in Woodville. Okay. Thank you, and that's already in the resolution as the recommendation, so we can move forward with receiving. Um, so I just want to put it in context. I know you're, you're testing me out there, aren't you? <laughs> At the deputation of, uh, of Andrew Vale regarding a request for relief for a high water bill for the Woodville Medical Center be received and that this recommendation be fought, brought forward to the council for consideration at the next regular council meeting. All in favor? And that's moved. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time today. Okay, we're moving into deputation 4.4, a licensed agreement between the City of Cortha Lakes and the Hickory Beach Dock Owners Association. Uh, I believe we have two deputants, do we, online today? Uh, welcome Sandy Medeiros and Fatima Barbosa. And uh, you have five minutes to give us an explanation and update. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Deputy Mayor, Mayor and members of Council. Um, I'm Sandy. And beside me here is my relative, Fatima Barbosa. She is the property owner of 15 uh, Pinewood Avenue in Fenland Falls. Um, I filed a deputation last year, and I was actually um, part of the council meeting as well in March of 2022. I do believe that there is a report on today's agenda regarding um, what I spoke of last year, encroachment of my relative's dog space by her neighbor who lives behind her at 9 and 11 Pinewood Avenue, who's also a member of the Hickory Beach Dock Association. Um, what I wanted to say today uh, was that, um, just to go over a few more things of the resolution of this whole situation that's been going on for the past number of years, is um, the encroachment of the dock space of my relatives, um, uh, docking space and the water um, is been a huge issue because she can't unfortunately dock a boat in her area due to the encroachment. And unfortunately, the encroachment occurred after this person became a member of the association. And due to the fact that she's abusing her position, uh, being part of the association, I do agree that um, a resolution needs to be um, done with the agreement that is now expiring in May of this year between the city of Kawartha, Kawartha Lakes and um, the association. Um, we're hoping to see a resolution of um, not renewing the contract between the city and the association and to uh, 
uh, return back to individual licensing, as I believe that's how it was before the agreement occurred a number of years ago. I believe it was five years ago. Um, it has been extremely stressful for my relative uh, because she can't enjoy um, her docking space with her family and her grandkids. Um, she's also waterfront and the neighbor is not waterfront. Um, as well as I do believe that there were pictures um, that were given to the members of council um, to take a look at today. Uh, the pictures are the before and the after of the encroachment. Um, it's very visible how much space has been encroached. Um, as well as, um, sorry, I'm just taking a look at my notes here. I just wanted to confirm that the members of council does have a copy of those pictures that they can take a look at. Yes, we do. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I, I'm not going to go into as much detail as I went into last year because I do believe the report's on the agenda, but we are um, in high hopes of a resolution um, so my relative can pretty much enjoy the waterfront property that she's owned for 32 years um, and, and uh, enjoy it with her family and her grandkids. And she would like to dock a boat. Um, she just hasn't been able to due to the to the problem at hand and um, and they do have actually two properties on their property land they actually have two cottages on their land so technically they do need that dock space in front of their property and they just don't have it um, due to the encroachment by their neighbor uh, at 9 and 11 Pinewood Avenue so we're really hoping for um, a resolution here because it's been a very stressful five years for her and her husband. Thank you. Oh, as well, sorry, I did, sorry, want to add that there was a, there were some steps there before the encroachment happened and they were taken apart and broken and some, some also a slab of cement, everything was just broken and taken apart without, without confirming with my relative to do so. And that was pretty much her, um, her steps and her uh, property, and uh, when the when the member of us, the association decided to encroach, she took that she broke it and she took it all away without speaking to her, my relative. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions currently? Oh, we do. Uh, Councillors, meeting. Thanks through you, Madam Chair. Just real quick. Um, so I'm right that the, the picture here that has the two properties, those are both Fatima's properties, correct? I know that sounds obvious, but those, yes. are, those are, yeah, so we can't see the other property, which is the point. I got it. I just want to, to make sure when I was looking at the two pictures that, yep, thanks. Councillor Perry. Thanks very much. Hi, Sandy. Thank you for coming and stating the case. I'm your ward councillor there in Ward 3. And um, just a question. I was wondering, um, how has, if at all, this issue been addressed through the existing association? Uh, well, my relative actually has tried to speak to the uh, member of the association who's caused this, um, but she doesn't, she, she, she ignores her. She doesn't. She said she would take my spot. Uh, well, my relative is saying right now that years ago, she actually did tell her that she was planning on taking the space. Uh, my relative said that she wasn't allowed to do that. Um, That's why she kept it for her. And then once she became a member of the association, that's when the, encroach the encroachment occurred. Um, so that's why it came to the it came to the point where she basically she became a member of the association and abused her position to get what she wanted. Once she, um, sorry, I'm just trying to relate what my relative is saying. Uh, once the encroachment occurred. Um, that is when this member decided to put up numbers on the docks. Um, so she, she actually initially had one dock and then now she has two docks. And Three. then that's when she put up the, the dock numbers to look like she's supposed to have two docks. But unfortunately, she's only supposed to have one. I hope that answers your question. No, no thank you. Yeah, I'm just wondering what the association's role. And um, so your relative has, uh, has two docks, correct? Currently, yes. When she purchased the property, yep. it was uh, two docks with the because of the two two homes um, right. and the waterfront. Yep. 
That was um, my understanding. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it is Thanks. No problem. Councillor Joyce. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Through you, um, uh, question: This, uh, I don't know. This association, I assume, it's a typical association with a hierarchy of a, of a board of directors and regular members. You're on mute. Sorry. I'm sorry. Were you speaking to me? Yes, I was, but I got the answer from Mayor Elmsley, so I'm good there. So my question, oh, next oh, question. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, this other member with the encroachment, are they on the board of directors of this association or are they a regular member? If, if you no, know that. Um, as far as I understand, I believe she's the, I believe she's the president of the Hickory, uh, Doc, uh, Hickory Beach Dock Association, if um if I if I am correct on that, but I don't believe she's a in the board of directors. Okay, so just you're, you're unsure, but that was a. Uh, I guess we can take a look at that. Thank you. No problem. Thank. Oh, uh, I see no other further questions at this time, and I just wanted to relate that the, uh, there's a report coming at seven point one on the agenda as well. So at this time that the deputation of Sandy Medeiros and Fatima Barboza regarding a license agreement between the City of Fourth Lakes and the Hickory Beach Dock Owners Association be received and that rec this recommendation be brought forward to Council for consideration at the next regular Council's meeting. Can I have a first and second? We have Councillor Perry and Councillor Warren. Thank you all in favor and passed. Thank you again for coming today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll move through the next part of the agenda. We have no correspondence at this time and number six no and we'll be starting our uh, presentations. Uh, the first one is 6.1 introductory overview of the Ping Kwan Association. Ryan Oliver, who's the Chief Executive Officer. Welcome and we're looking forward to your presentation today. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for, for having me here. I appreciate uh, uh, you guys taking the time to hear this. Um, my name is Ryan Oliver. I am the Chief Executive Officer of the Pingwok Association. Uh, I moved to Lindsay in 1985. As a five-year-old, my father was brought here by TS Manufacturing as a part of a job there. And I ended up going to, through my school here, I went to high school at IE Weldon in the 1990s. Um, and at that time, in the 1990s, uh, Robert Mathers was our, uh, was our computer science teacher. And he, uh, he taught for five years myself and my peer group, computer science. We, t we learned the basics of computers. And as a result, as I get through in this presentation, it, it's had an impact on this community uh, and, and the country uh, in a way that I'm hoping that we can start to re-spark in this area. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the Pingwok Association I founded uh, in 2012 in Pangnertang, Nunavut. Uh, after growing up here, I moved to Nunavut for 10 years. Uh, and after a while of working for the government in Nunavut, uh, kind of saw a connection that I could make where we could bring technology and bring technology opportunities to people in Nunavut. And subsequently, now that we've expanded as a national organization uh, into rural, remote, and indigenous communities across Canada. And so our mission is up there on the board. Um, but essentially, you know, what we do is we support the development of STEAM skills. And we do that. And STEAM, in this case, stands for science, technology, engineering, arts and math. Uh, and we do that through technology, art, and play. And the word pingwak is inuktitut for the word play. Uh, and that is that is a core of what we do. We, we have over 80 staff nationally. In this community alone, we have over 45 staff now uh, with offices here in Lindsay at 87 Adelaide, the old medical building there in that picture, uh, as well as a headquarters in Akhaluit, Nunavut, uh, uh, and a network of maker spaces across the country. So next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, Mr. Mathers, uh, he had a group of us, I think there was maybe 20 of us, uh, and he came in one day with a pile of books and just said, I do not understand this stuff, but this is the future. We've got to figure it out together. And we had five years of school from grade nine to OAC, because we had grade 13 in the day, uh, where we developed a computer science course together. These games, these pieces of technology on the screen here, all have one, two, in some cases up to six people from Lindsay 
from the Kawartha Lakes on those teams. Every single line of pictures there is over a billion dollars in sales and technology. There were people from Lindsay involved in the creation of the BlackBerry. There were people involved in the FIFA series, the, big, the single biggest sports video game on the entire planet. Um, the Canadian video game market and the Canadian technology market, but video games by themselves are worth $5 billion. And there are, there are people from the Kawartha Lakes involved in almost every aspect of that. Uh, next slide, please. So, this organization, we function off of a life cycle. We try, we understand a lot of the communities that we serve ultimately uh, are underserviced uh, by, in technology in particular. There's kind of this belief that when you, when, if you want to get into tech, you got to move to Silicon Valley or you got to move to Toronto or Vancouver at the best, uh, at the minimum. Uh, our goal is to keep people in their communities, keep the dollars they earn in the communities, keep uh, their ability to stay connected to their families. And we do this through our life cycle. We provide education to people. We provide resources to people. What that means is every single person who ever partakes in, in a learning that we do uh, gets a free laptop gets a laptop to keep because we are focused on sustainability. Uh, we provide mentors. Uh, over Close to 50% of my staff base is Indigenous. Um, that, the goal there is so that other Indigenous kids, other kids in communities that we serve can see themselves in the industry and it shrinks the industry. I grew up in, in a high school program where all of my peers uh, I, I didn't do well enough in math, so I had to take the long way to get to the industry. But every single one of my peers went into this industry and, and created those games you saw on the scene before. This industry is very small to me, and that's what we're trying to do next. We provide employment opportunities, and we still, to this day, we create apps, games, websites. Uh, and we do that through a social enterprise, where all the money earned through that gets reinvested into the not-for-profit, but at the same time, um, as we're doing that, we're building capacity in the communities we're building for. Um, this whole piece is centered around this idea of advocacy for the communities that we're working in. Like I said, from that, in that starting point, it's, you, do, you shouldn't have to leave home to go work in this industry. And the industry needs to adjust itself to the reality of rural, remote, and indigenous living in this country. Next slide. So when I moved back to Lindsay in 2015, uh, I was just in my basement on Elgin Street. Uh, and it was just me. And over time, I, you know, since 2015, we've, we've led up to 80 staff. Uh, and we held events everywhere we could. We were hosting events in the basement of the library. We were in the, in the Kawartha Lakes Art Gallery, uh, in the park sometimes. Next slide. Um, with the idea that we could just bring, whet the appetite, bring as much opportunity to, to youth in the Kawartha Lakes and, and increasingly adults now as we work. We've been in schools. We're just outside there on Kent Street. Uh, and, and taking those opportunities. And next slide, in 2018, I think it was, it might have been 19, it was 19. 2019, we took over uh, 87 Adelaide Street North. Uh, and that is, for those that have the memory, the old, it used to be a medical building. If you've ever been upstairs in there, it is a maze. It is unreal. If you, if I've been in there for four years now, I still get lost. Um, but the day we moved in there, we grew out of it. And we, and, and we knew we needed something, something bigger. Um, but what we created there was our makerspace. And for us, a makerspace, you know, in a big city, in Montreal, if you go to a makerspace, that is a space with a whole pile of tools that anyone can you know, pay a membership fee and go and use. You can make t-shirts, you can use a 3D printer, you could use virtual reality. For us, a makerspace is an education center. It's a place where, yes, you can access all those tools, but accompanying that is gonna be the education and the mentors and the opportunities to, to tie those in to create practical solutions for your community. So we've been, pro, uh, we've, we opened up the makerspace in Lindsay in October uh, 2019. Six months later, it had to close for two and a half years. Uh, but we've been back for about a year now. Uh, and again, like I said, it, it, we grew out of it so quickly. Next slide. Um, we, you know, you can see this picture here on the front lawn, and it was this summer that I kind of started to realize as we run summer camps there all year, uh, we have 10 feet of grass to work with, and, and it's not enough, and we needed more. And in that time, uh, next slide, um, uh, another building came up. And so, and so it doesn't just house what we do in that makerspace, though. It houses our staff that are servicing this country. Uh, in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And sometimes that takes the, uh, the form of games. We develop games and apps and experiences. You can see top right there is, uh, is a spelling game that we developed for the Inuktitut language uh, to, to get people used to an Inuktitut keyboard. Uh, below that is a game we developed uh, 
with uh, a community near Six Nations in Brantford, uh, which shows uh, constellations, but with an indigenous perspective on it. We produced a magazine. This, this community is home to a, an award-winning magazine called Root and Stem that uh, tells our story, tells the story of, of technology in rural, remote, and indigenous communities. And because of that, through COVID, we also started to create kits, and that's the one on the far left there, where we can actually go into a school if we can't actually be there in person. Uh, we provide up to 20,000 kits a year, all made in Lindsay, shipped across the country to schools and to camps to, to run community uh, programming for themselves. Next slide. So, February 17th, we closed on 12 Peel Street. This is an old city building. Um, I think the engineering department used to be in there. Um, this is on the corner of Peel and William. Uh, and over the next year, we are going to turn this place into the jewel of Lindsay, the jewel of the Kawartha Lakes. It is going to be a space that people can come and have access to technology and continue to create on the legacy of the sorts of, of experiences that have people from this area attached to them. Uh, next slide. We're moving from 1,400 square feet in the, uh, in the, medical, in the medical building right now to 13,500. Uh, we will have three full maker spaces, each one in the 2,000 square foot range. Uh, we will have 20 plus offices, podcast studios, streaming studios. It will become the home for science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And what's important to note on this is all of our programming is free. Um, we are well funded by the federal government. Uh, in 2015, the Trudeau government created a program called CanCode. Uh, that, has, uh, that has helped us take these next steps. In 2016, we won the Arctic Inspiration Prize. Uh, that helped us get a cash flow going. In 2017, we were nominated as the best social enterprise in all of Canada. I didn't know what a social enterprise was at that time. I do now, and that's what we are, it turns out. <laughs> so that's great. Um, but we continue, we have a big development team, mostly filled with people from Lindsay that are raising funds for us. Uh, and it's allowed us to buy this building. But the other piece to that too is that the social enterprise that is our, our app, website, and development, uh, development team. We are one of the only coding organizations that tries to pair kids from the very beginning with real lived experiences. We've recently developed apps across Canada, animation experiences for kids' help phone. Uh, we recently finished a game, uh, the one you just saw up there in Brantford, the idea being that like, I can take a group of kids that are learning in a makerspace and give them their first chance to build a portfolio to get paid for the work they do and to inform the product that they're ultimately building. Uh, next slide. So this year on this building, uh, you'll see already there's, there's some big fences around it. We've, we've ripped the inside out. Now we've got to put it back together. Uh, we're going to be investing $1 million this year in the renovation uh, entirely locally. Um, it's going to be designs by Tim and, or home by Tim and Chris. Is there? Uh, it's going to be the designs by homes by Tim and Chris uh, out of Fenland, and then our construction team is O'Neill and Carol. Uh, I know Hayden now lives in Lindsay, but they're all originally Downeyville guys. Uh, we're going to be investing uh, just through our programming as a result of this space uh, over a million dollars this year in Kawartha Lakes digital skills businesses, and in the next year. Uh, in, in the next two years, sorry, and $10 million nationally. The government, Ontario government, Nunavut government, and, uh, and, and federal government come to us a lot of the time and say like, no one has the reach you guys do. No one can get the communities you guys get. Uh, can you please take this program and deliver it for us? <laughs> and so as a result, it's, it's a bit of an embarrassment of riches. We're given programs such as the Digital Skills for Youth program, uh, the Green Jobs Fund, uh, and with that, we can make sure on behalf of, in those cases, those programs, the federal government, that we are targeting the people that are the least likely to be targeted by a big organization like the federal government, the people in the, in the smallest communities and the businesses that need it the most. That'll continue this year. We've, we've raised a total of 10 million to give out nationally over the next two years. Um, we'll also be providing free digital skills programming. I mentioned this on the last slide. We provide daily uh, workshops for youth, daily workshops for adults. Uh, the real, we're into schools every single day. We're training and working with the Boys and Girls Club on a, on a regular basis. Um, like I said, there is no reason that a small community cannot be a center for technology development in this, in this country. And Lindsay, without us realizing it, has already done it. 
Uh, we're gonna build a hall of fame in this, in this center to celebrate that story that's gonna be very similar to what you see when you go into the rec center. When you go into the rec center in Lindsay, you know who our sports heroes were, right? Uh, we wanna build the same thing in this building so that when you go in, you know, like, oh my God, like I play that game and there's like three people from Lindsay on that team. That's an incredibly powerful thing for kids growing up in this community. Uh, next slide. So I wanted to walk you through. These are designs that I hope make some amount of sense. I am leaning a little bit on the fact this used to be a city building, and so hopefully a few of you have been in this building before. But on the bottom floor, so what is the floor that is kind of half above ground, half below ground, uh, that's going to be the center for education. There's going to be three full maker spaces there with uh, removable dividing walls and the newest, the highest end technology for kids to be able to access. There's, there's, we have our teams that travel across Ontario, specifically based out of Lindsay, so we have vans that you'll see near 87 Adelaide on a regular basis. Their team, their storages are there, so that's where they're heading out from. We're gonna, we're gonna build a big playground. We're only a block away from, from the water. The amount of science and the amount of uh, engineering and the amount of technology we're gonna be able to play with in this space is beyond exciting. Next slide. Uh, on the second floor, we're gonna open this up to the community, and specifically, I want to recognize that like, uh, organizations like Thrive uh, on Kent Street, the Lindsay Business Hub, uh, the new space that just opened above the Scotiabank uh, place, they're doing a good job at tackling entrepreneurs. They, they are building, you know, they're giving a space for entrepreneurs that may work remotely. Our space is going to be for not-for-profits, for artists, for people that we partner with already. Uh, it's going to have a podcast studio built in. It's going to have a VR lab. It is going to have the collaboration um, of of the community, like 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 minded community members that are gonna be able to come together, not necessarily to build like the next big startup, that's gonna be happening in the basement, but, uh, and then when they succeed, they're gonna be able to go to Thrive, they're gonna be able to go to Rails. But this is gonna be the spot where where the magic happens, where where people collaborate as, and, and come together. Um, and then on the next slide is, is the third floor. This is, we'll, we'll have our staff there. And it's, it's likely a lot of our staff will work on the second floor as well, because we have so many and a lot of people are returning to work now. Um, this is gonna be, the most advanced, the sexiest office space in Lindsay um, by quite a bit. And I'm really excited to have this done. The designs that Tim and Chris have done already are incredible. Uh, so it's very exciting. And next slide. Next slide. Last one. Uh, I wanted to present this, uh, A, because like this is the first time we've owned a building in Lindsay uh, of this side as, as a not-for-profit. Um, and so I don't know why you can see my drawing there, uh, but that's the building from above. The, the area in green, that's where we want to put a playground. Uh, and the area in yellow, we need a spot for buses to be able, and, and parents to be able to quickly drop off their kids and take off. I don't know what that means in terms of zoning. I'm, uh, I'm here to reach out and say like, hey, help me with this part. How do I officially request that? Um, we need that bus and car drop off. The other piece of this, uh, the previous owners rented to the city. For whatever reason, the previous owners never had to pay property taxes. I don't know why. Um, I'm assuming something was built into the rental agreement over the 13 years the city rented, rented the place. As a result, when we bought this place, we weren't able to get a previous property tax assessment. The taxes haven't been paid on that building in close to 15 years now. Um, and I'm not sure if it was an oversight. But what we want to figure out is as a not-for-profit, as a charity building up a space that, uh, that looks at, how do, we, how do we alleviate what we're estimating right now is $40,000 in property taxes. That $40,000 is, is another job I could create. It's another, it's another whole series of free workshops we could run. Um, and I think we're not looking for anything special beyond perhaps like whatever the Boys and Girls Club gets, if, if anything. And if not, then that's a conversation too. Like I said, I'm not sure why, but there's been no property taxes paid on that place in a while. Um, and so, uh, so we're, we're starting to assume the worst and, and requesting the best, if possible. Uh, we're going to need permitting for that playground. That's going to become a part of this. And then ultimately, like, I want to collaborate. We are an organization, like I said, that whole second floor, we're going to be inviting organizations we work with day to day, the, the organizations we're co-writing grants with, the organizations we're being able to provide internships to. Um, we are a collaborative organization that ultimately puts the community at the center of whatever it is we do. The way our space looks like in a Kaluit Nunavut is very different than what this space is gonna be because the needs are different there. One of the needs though that is consistent is housing. Like I said, I moved to this town because my dad got a job at TS Manufacturing um, and that brought my whole family here and now that it's spread out, there's now four homes full of Olivers. We've got our families growing up here. 
I've been able to do the same for some of my staff. I've brought a whole pile of people here from Toronto until COVID hit. I had four people uh, that wanted to move here from my team that couldn't and actually ended up finding more affordable housing in downtown Toronto. They had to get way worse housing, but it was still like they could actually afford it because the reality is it doesn't exist here. We can help with that. I don't know how. I don't, like, we, can, we can collaborate on that. We are really good at raising money. We want to find ways to, to house people because I have so many high level tech people making big dollars for their wages that could move into this community tomorrow if I had somewhere to put them. And that's what we haven't had. We want to collaborate on funding. We want to collaborate as partners and ultimately make the Kortha Lakes as a destination and as a spot known for science and technology, engineering, arts, and math, um, and celebrate that fact. So I think that's it. Is there anything else? <laughs> that's great. Perfect. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Oliver, and uh, it, it is a good news story. It's exciting, and um, we'll just see if we have any questions. We have quite a few questions here. Uh, we'll start with counselors meeting first. I'll be quick with my experience and just say that you know how well I know it. And, uh, and I, I would just add one quick question of one of the reasons you and I ever since 2015 have known and, and taken advantage of this is through the schools. So I'm just curious about a couple things. Has the school board trustees, are they also doing presentations to the school board to get funding from the school board as well because I know uh, the school board is benefiting enormously maybe even my words not yours yeah. highest highest percentage of local municipal benefit might be our school children okay my words not yours but yeah. certainly every grade six teacher I know and I was one uh, struggles with the steam steam is new to the curriculum just so people know as well in the last two three years so a lot of us were reaching out to you and you were amazing your whole team was phenomenal um, just curious that's question I have a couple questions so that's my first quick one yeah, I mean, really quick answer is we've been really good at connecting with schools individually, yeah. like our experience with yourself, uh, less so the school board, and that's, I think, as much on us as anything because we just haven't had the time to coordinate that because it's like we're, we're busy enough. And, sure, and just yeah. correlating data. Like, I just know that when you go to a school or when we approach you, it's free for free. We, you know, Absolutely, 100%. And I'm just, if we're, we're asking for a lot here, so I'm just wondering if the, if the, um, the corporation that is responsible for allocating funds to children, if they've been spoken to the same way we have. Just... Just curious, so that's that. That's good, I know. Okay. Um, I have a question possibly for the CAO or the mayor or the deputy mayor, I'm not sure who, of the $75,000 that were given, that was given to this group this year by the CHEST fund, um, that $75,000, can 40,000 of it go towards property taxes? Or is that, can a CHEST fund not go into property tax? Because they did receive $75,000 in CHEST funding this year. And he, I was just curious if that's even possible, just being new. Director Shanks? Sorry. Oh, is it me? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, through you, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, to Council. So uh, the, the policy on use of chest funds currently is that it cannot be used for operational purposes. Uh, it also, uh, when chest fund applications are approved, the funds must be used for the scope of the application that's been applied. And I think for these funds, it was specific to the flooring of the facility, but I'm not 100% certain on that. Okay. okay. That's nice. That was good to know. I just wasn't sure if there was. Yeah, no, it's accurate there. though. Like the that's the flooring that we will be doing. It. So 45, 45, well, let's go with 47. I think it's where I'm more like 47 staff members here in Lindsay, 80. Let's go with 45 and 80 in Canada, just for easy numbers, yep. 45 here, 80 Canada. What is the federal funding per year? Like you mentioned that uh, 1 million for renovations is, is an ask, is something you're contributing 1 million uh, to the city of Lakes over the next two years and then the 500,000. So those are numbers that you're paying out. What yeah. is, what is, what do, if you don't mind my asking, what does the federal government give you per year? Yeah, uh, so we're project-based at the end of the day. I know. Uh, right. No core funding. Um, our, our annual budget right now is $6 million as an organization, that's nationally. Uh, federal government provides 60% of it. So I'm not doing the math quick enough in my head, but 3.5, no, so, 4 million. But 60%. Um, the Ontario government, uh, this year has not funded us, um, uh, but then the government of Nunavut provides about 20% of, of our operational funding, primarily for operations in Nunavut. The rest we earn through the social enterprise, building those uh, apps, the games, the experiences that, that we do. Um, that's the rest. That was, I think that might yeah. have equaled 100%. That's great. And I'm going to call Mr. Mathers tonight and tell him how proud he should be. Right on. <laughs> yeah, I've been trying to get a hold of uh, Rob Mathers for a while just to let him know what he's done. I don't think he knows. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councillor Warren? 
Yes, for you, um, Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you for coming. This is some of the best news I've heard in a long, long time, Ryan, and uh, great presentation. Um, and uh, yes, I've been in that building, and it sure needed a facelift, and it's going to be really exciting to see what you're, you're going to be doing. I, am, I know um, the city has, in the past, and I still um, has waived taxes on certain community organizations, so it's okay. something that needs to be debated. Okay, and that's like, I guess ultimately is that a, a request we would formally make, similar to the first four yes. requests this morning? Think, okay, yeah. perfect, thank you. thank you. I'm learning process while I'm up here, I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Ashmore. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor, to, uh, to Ryan. Um, thanks for your presentation, and it's, you've got a good cross-section of like the science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Some of these, some of these technologies, they've certainly increased from the days of of uh, Pac-Man and asteroids. So Far Cry Six, that's that's one of the that's one of the uh, really high-tech uh, and popular games. I think from what I've uh, uh, one of my sons, I guess he he, he uses that, but uh, the FIFA as well. And um, I know on Lindsay, like they have some. It seems to be a, uh, there's a lot of higher high tech uh, um, industries around, like Control V out in the mall. There, that's that's mm -hmm. one of the you know one of the uh, uh, attractions of, of Lindsay as well. A lot of people are going go to that. Um, my question is, uh, okay, your perch, you you have purchased the building, have you? Correct. Yeah, no, we and, took it over February and 17th. If I remember, that building on engineering was in it. There's a car park on the east side. Do you do you own that as well? We do. Yeah, that's that was a nice feature. Yeah. Okay, so that that should give you some parking. Absolutely. Space. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again. Thank you. Yeah, that was uh, that was one of the final sticking points on the building purchase was ultimately making sure we got that parking lot so that we had enough parking. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I don't see any other uh, questions at this time. Uh, so at this time, that the presentation by Ryan Oliver, Chief Executive Officer for the Penguin Association regarding an introductory overview of the Penguin Association be received, and that this recommendation be brought forward to Council for consideration at the next uh, regular Council meeting. First and a second. We have Councillor Warren and Councillor McDonald. All in favor? Uh, at this time, I just want to—I uh, want to say thank you again for moving home, Mr. Oliver, and uh, go Weldon. Um, I'm just—I'm uh, going to at this time ask you to actually do a formal written request to the CAO just about your, what you're looking for, your next steps. I think that would be a good process to go through. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Great. So now we will move into presentation 6.2, Bill 23, Heritage Impacts, and the one and only Emily Turner. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, members of Council, um, I promised at our last Committee of the Whole meeting that I would be back with a PowerPoint and presentation regarding Bill 23 and its Heritage Impacts. So here we go. Um, is the power, oh, there's the PowerPoint, super. All right, um, next slide. Okie dokie. So, um, Bill 23, as we've discussed at a number of um, a number of occasions, has made some substantial changes to a whole variety of different planning processes, um, including those for preserving cultural heritage resources. Um, these include amendments to the Ontario Heritage Act, as well as a number of amendments to the Planning Act, which impact um, heritage resource conservation. Generally, the amendments that the province made, um, they were intended to more closely align heritage preservation with wider land use planning processes. So we're often addressing um, heritage properties through our development application processes. Um, so there were some alignment um, items that the province decided to make. So that those two things um, ran more closely together. Um, unfortunately, while some of the amendments are, are positive, some of them have very little impact um, or just sort of procedural, um, some of them do significantly challenge our ability to preserve heritage properties, uh, particularly when it comes to working in conjunction with and consulting with our communities. Um, so we and many other municipalities take the approach that heritage preservation um, is very much um, a joint effort between the municipality and the community and these amendments make that extremely difficult in a lot of cases. Um, so part of the reason why 
Council is getting its own presentation on heritage um, is because a lot of major heritage matters are uh, council responsibilities. So while I deal with some of the day-to-day -day things, uh, heritage permitting, uh, doing research, working with the community, um, many of those big decision-making items uh, require council approval. So um, you will get to see me a lot, quite a bit, uh, through for various things. Um, and many of the, the amendments that the province has put forward to us will require council action. Um, so the goal of this presentation today is just to provide an overview of the heritage items that council will see over 2023 and beyond. Um, there are a number of amendments that I don't really touch on too much in this presentation uh, because they're procedural items uh, such as uh, having to have a copy of our heritage register online um, that are just dealt with by staff and are being worked on in the background at the moment. Uh, next slide. Okay, so we'll jump right into it. Um, so what, how I've sort of divided this presentation up is I've categorized the different amendments um, into a few different areas, uh, touch base on the amendments and then outline some action items. Uh, so we'll start with the listing of property. Um, so just as a reminder for everyone, um, listed properties are those which are included on our heritage register but are not designated um, either individually as or as part of a heritage conservation district. We have a lot of these properties um, and we, over the past number of years, we've been continually identifying and adding to our listed properties. So these impact quite a few properties through our Fourth Lakes. So here are the amendments. Uh, so the first is that any property owner may object to a listing under the processes um, that were outlined in the 2019 amendments to the act, no matter when it was listed on the register. So prior to these amendments, there were two separate processes for um, objecting to a listing depending on when it was listed. Um, and the amendments to Bill 23, through Bill 23 have made it so that there's a single process, which actually makes our lives quite a bit easier. So um, that, uh, that's something that is not, not a terrible thing. Um, the next one is that listed properties must now meet at least one criteria under Ontario Regulation 906, um, which is the criteria provided by the province um, to identify cultural heritage value in order to be eligible for listing on the register. Previously, uh, they didn't have to be evaluated at all. Uh, we just had to think they might kind of have cultural heritage value. Um, this isn't retroactive, so we don't have to go back and evaluate all of our properties. Um, but to be honest, we actually already do this at Cortha Lake. So we're already doing this. It's uh, so it's not really a change of process for us. Next slide. Uh, the next three items here um, do have a little bit more impact on the work that we're doing. Um, so this is regard to removing a property from the register. So there's three situations where a property now must be removed from the register. So the first is if council moves to designated listed property and the bylaw is not repassed or it is repealed on appeal um, through the Ontario Land Tribunal. The second is that non-designated properties must have a notice of intention to designate issued within two years of the amendments coming into force or must be removed from the register. Or that non-designated properties which are listed on the register after the amendments come into force, which was January 1st of this year, um, must have a notice of intention designate, to designate issued within two years or be removed from the register. And those that are removed cannot be relisted for five years. So basically what this means is that properties can only stay on the register for two years. Prior to this, a property could be listed. It could just stay there forever and ever. Um, and if we, we needed to do something with it, we could. And otherwise, it just stayed there. Uh, next slide. So there are a few action items coming out of this um, that council will see. <clears throat> the first is that an amendment to the heritage applications policy will be required to respond to the consolidated objections process. So at the moment, um, our major heritage policy is called the heritage applications policy. It came into effect in 2021 and it outlines um, everything that um, property owners and the city need to do when it comes to a variety of different kinds of applications related to heritage properties. Um, so that will require an amendment. Um, the second one is something that I'll touch on a little bit later um, in this presentation and go into in more depth, is that the province has effectively directed municipalities to designate their listed properties. So um, we received direction from the ministry um, that we are to review our heritage register, identify which properties have cultural heritage value and designate them. Um, prioritization of certain properties is gonna be required. We have a lot of properties um, and a very small team. By a small team, I mean it's myself and our very dedicated Municipal Heritage Committee. Um, 
And we are going to have to go through the register and bring forward properties to designation for council. And those will come forward on a case by case basis. Um, the last one is that a change of strategy for listing properties from mass listings to strategic, to strategic listing where properties are threatened or have the potential for redevelopment. So in the past, we brought forward uh, large batches of properties for listing. Um, those of you who are in council previously will have seen quite a number of these. Um, that's not going to happen anymore. So we are now going to be bringing forward properties on an individual basis um, where listing is seen to be warranted. Next slide. Okay, so moving into individual property designation. So this deals with the in designation of property individually under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, we have about 90 individually designated properties in Fourth Lakes um, and quite a few others that are eligible for individual property designation, including many of our listed properties. Um, so the amendments for these, uh, there's two main ones that I'm going to outline for you. The first is that the threshold for designation has been increased so that a property must meet two of the Ontario Regulation 906 criteria in order to be eligible for designation. Previously, it only had to meet one, so that threshold has been increased. In practice, that probably won't do anything um, to how we review and evaluate properties. Uh, most properties that are brought forward um, for designation are fulfilling probably three or four of those criteria, if not more. Um, so I don't anticipate that that will have a, a substantial impact on our programming. Um, the second is with regard to designations related to Planning Act applications. So in 2019, uh, the province brought forward amendments to the Act, which created a 90-day time limit for a notice of intention to designate be issued when certain types of Planning Act applications are made for a property. Uh, those types of Planning Act applications are official plan amendments, zoning bylaw amendments, and plans of subdivision. Um, so effectively what this did is it meant that if um, council wanted to designate a property as a condition of approval for a Planning Act application, which um, municipalities do from time to time, um, it must be done within the first 90 days of that application coming in. Um, so the amendments that have been made through Bill 23, they retain that timeline, so we still have that timeline, but it require that a property must be listed on the register prior to the receipt of the planning application in order to be eligible for designation. So if council would like to designate a property as a condition of approval for a planning act application, and that would come forward uh, through a staff report um, and would be reviewed through uh, planning advisory committee, um, it must be listed first. So we cannot just designate properties um, where planning applications are coming forward, it has to be listed, which is challenging due to the short timelines um, on listing that are now in effect. Next slide. Um, so the real impact here is trying to figure out which properties might have a Planning Act application coming forward where listing uh, might be appropriate in case council may want to um, uh, use designation as a strategy to guide that development. Um, it's likely that these properties will be identified through pre-consultation. Um, that is a confidential process, um, but the designation of properties uh, and the listing of properties is a public process. So certainly we'll have to balance um, those two particular processes and their level of confidentiality. Um, so how this will work in practice is council will see properties being brought forward for listing on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I like to think of it uh, a Formerly, we saw listing as something where we just identified and recognized heritage properties and put them aside for later, just in case we, uh, we got a demolition application for them uh, or to recognize the fact that they've been conserved. Um, that sh has now shifted so that listing is really equivalent to, um, to something like a holding provision. So uh, just I would think of listing as, as a way to ensure that heritage matters can be addressed through the planning process. Um, and then once uh, once that planning process is over, uh, the listing will automatically um, twilight off of that property with the two-year limitation. Or if council deems it appropriate, the property can be designated as part of that application. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so heritage conservation districts. So currently we have two heritage conservation districts in Cork Lakes. These are areas that are designated under part five of the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, and comprise um, a number of different properties uh, that together have cultural heritage value um, as a wider landscape. Uh, so the amendments have done two major things. The first is the establishment of criteria for the designation of districts. 
So prior to these amendments, there were no provincially regulated criteria. There were some standard ones that most municipalities used, um, but it was a little bit willy nilly. So um, there are now new criteria, which ensures that um, a designation of districts is consistent across the province. So these new criteria are based on Ontario Regulation 906, um, and 25% of the properties in a district must meet at least two of these prescribed criteria to be eligible for designation. Uh, the second is something that we don't have yet, but we know it's coming. Um, so that is the introduction of regulations for processes to repeal or amend heritage designation, H, sorry, heritage conservation district designations and plans. Uh, these don't currently exist. Um, so if council would like to make an amendment to a heritage conservation district plan, um, it can't. Uh, so in the future, um, we will be able to do this, uh, which is, is good because it means that we can modernize conservation district plans where that's warranted. Um, it's likely that the regulations will be released at some point in 2023. Um, and when they are, and if actions are required, I'll come back to council with those at that time. Next slide. Um, so for our action items, we have a few things that council will see. Um, so unfortunately, uh, the province did not provide any transition provisions for these regulations, which means that the Heritage Conservation District that we currently have in development, uh, which is the old mill HCD, is going to have to be reevaluated based on the current criteria. Um, so that will mean going back into the study, um, amending it, and council will have to approve that amendment. Um, so I will be working on that and bringing it forward to council for approval. Um, we will also have a public meeting to address that reevaluation. So it really sets us back um, in the process for bringing forward the Heritage Conservation District Plan, um, which was scheduled for this fall. Um, so that's gonna have to be bumped back uh, so that the area can now be reevaluated um, and that brought forward to council. Um, the next action item is integrating the evaluation criteria into the draft HCD strategy, which is currently in preparation. So um, at the moment, I'm working on a strategy for how we address uh, future Heritage Conservation District designations. Um, the Heritage Committee was reviewing it and working on it in the fall, and we've sort of gone back to the drawing board with that um, because there have been these substantial changes, um, but it will come forward to Council at some point this year. Uh, similarly, additional policy or bylaw changes might be required when the regulations regarding amendments and repeals come forward, but we don't have those yet, so we don't know what those are. Um, next slide. Um, so the Planning Act. So there are obviously a, a wider range of um, uh, amendments made to the Planning Act. Most of them do not impact uh, heritage properties specifically, although they may have an impact on applications that have heritage properties related to them, but they're not conservation specific. Um, the main item is with regard to site plan control. So in the past, we have used site plan control to ensure heritage conservation within the development process and divide uh, and guide architectural design. So if you have um, a development that's integrating a heritage building or adjacent to a heritage building, um, we are allowed through the provincial policy statement to um, set architectural design requirements for um, uh, to ensure that adjacent development is not impacting heritage resource. Uh, and we're not allowed to do this anymore. So if we have a new development that is adjacent to or involves a heritage resource, we are no longer to, allowed to address architectural design or other aesthetic issues through site plan approval. Um, so an action item for this one, um, we're going to have to make some amendments to our heritage application policy. Um, and this can be used to provide some alternative solutions uh, for architectural design guidance. We may need some additional policy changes in future, um, but this is certainly something that we're going to have to see how it plays out. Um, most municipalities use site plan to deal with aesthetic issues, um, particularly when related to heritage properties. Um, so this will be something that I will be keeping an eye on the wider context across the province and see how this uh, see how this issue is dealt with. Next slide. Okay, so those are the main issues um, and amendments that were made to the Ontario Heritage Act and then also to the Planning Act with regard to site plan control. Um, so I'd like to loop back to the review and designation of listed properties. Um, this is the largest task that we have as a result of the amendments. All designations are approved by council. Um, so they come forward to you as a staff report um, and then as a bylaw for passage. 
So our heritage register includes 289 listed properties. And realistically, um, there is only the capacity to designate a limited number per year over the next two years, um, probably between 10 and 20 a year. Uh, that might be very optimistic. Um, last year, we designated five properties. So to put this in perspective, um, it will require some substantial staffing resources and time to get this done. Um, but this is the direction that we have received from the province, so we must do it. Um, the provincial direction that we're receiving does suggest designating properties under Part 4 of the Act, but there isn't a prohibition against Part 5 designations. So Part 5 is Heritage Conservation Districts. Um, so what, uh, what we have come up with, myself and the Municipal Heritage Committee, is the prioritization of some properties um, for individual designation and the development of new Heritage Conservation Districts um, to capture some of our other listed properties. Uh, so one of the things that uh, is important to keep in mind is that properties can still be designated after that two-year period has elapsed. That is, unless a Planning Act application has been received for them. So just going back to um, that prohibition on designating a property when there's a Planning Act application um, in the works for it, that would limit our ability to designate a property if it has fallen off the register after that two-year period. Um, as a result, uh, we need to prioritize properties that have a higher chance of redevelopment and demolition. Um, as much as we would like to maybe pick the properties that we like the most, um, there is a way that we, we do need to go about this to ensure that properties with a high level of cultural heritage value, um, where there's the potential for them to be torn down or redeveloped, have some protection provided to them. Next slide. Um, so priorities for part four designation will hit those with the highest chance of redevelopment. And um, those are as follows. So properties with a known or anticipated risk of demolition or redevelopment. Sometimes we know they're coming. We know those are coming. Um, so those will be prioritized. Commercial and industrial properties. Um, those properties always have a higher risk of redevelopment than, say, um, somebody's nice Victorian house. Um, so those are... Uh, those will be prioritized as well. Institutional properties, um, those are basically churches and schools. Um, particularly with many rural churches, those are closing. Um, so we do need to see what's happening with those to ensure that the heritage value that they have both intrinsically architecturally, but also to the community as institutional spaces um, are preserved as well. And then the last are landmark and unique properties with extremely high and demonstrable cultural heritage value. So these are those which they may not have a very high chance of redevelopment, but we know they have a very high amount of cultural heritage value. Um, so preserving them is warranted uh, just in case something might come forward for them. Um, so residential properties, so people's homes, will be the lowest priority. They're at the lowest risk of redevelopment. Um, it is very unlikely that a demolition or redevelopment application is going to come forward for somebody's lovely Victorian home. It, it does happen, um, but not with the kind of regularity as with other properties. Um, designation of these properties may be considered if appropriate, um, but they will be the last priority. Um, we also have four city-owned listed properties, and they're going to be brought forward for designation first. And by they're going to be brought forward, I mean they're in, they're in this agenda. So we'll address that a little bit further on down the menu. Um, next slide. Um, we've also some identified some priorities for part five designation, that is those as heritage conservation districts. So we do have some groups of listed properties um, that have coherent cultural heritage value, where they're all really close together. They all form part of a landscape where they're more suited for part five designation than for individual designation. Um, this, per this has some advantages um, in that it provides design guidelines, particularly for commercial areas, um, and it does have some disadvantages in that it takes a lot longer. Um, so the main priority for this will be to commercial areas and also those which have a very high degree of cultural heritage value and are unique to Portha Lakes. Um, once again, we're not prioritizing residential neighborhoods. Um, for the same reason as for individual properties, they have the lowest risk of redevelopment. And if we're going to if we're going to have a residential property that has a risk of redevelopment, we're going to do it um, as an individual designation. So there are three main priority areas that have been identified by myself and the Municipal Heritage Committee. The first is Bob Cajun Market Square, um, which is the um, uh, the area that includes the old promoter building, 
um, the Bob Cajun in the Presbyterian Church uh, in and around that area of Bob Cajun, uh, downtown Olimi, so that is King Street um, and the commercial properties along the highway, and then also Sturgeon Point. So Sturgeon Point is obviously not a commercial area, um, but it has an extremely high degree of cultural heritage value as an extant late 19th and early 20th century cottage community. Um, these designations are a multi-year process. Um, naturally within the, the provisions of the act, they include a lot of community consultation. Um, so these will take quite some time, um, but this is likely the most appropriate method of preserving these listed properties. Um, so the intention is to pursue these over the next number of years. Um, we could still identify additional areas over the next, um, over the next years, um, and it could be designated at a later date, um, but these are our, our priority areas. Um, and just for, uh, sort of just for context, it usually takes three to four years to designate a heritage conservation district. Um, so this is not a tomorrow problem. This is a five, 10, uh, 15 years in the future um, type project. Next slide, please. So one of the things I wanted to touch on was the idea of owner consent. Um, so we in Kawartha Lakes have often spoken about uh, the idea that a property owner needs to be on board. Um, we want to make sure everybody's talked to and is really happy about it. Um, in general, we've usually only considered designations that have been property owner requested. Um, we have not pers aggressively pursued designations um, where an owner doesn't want it. That being said, the Ontario Heritage Act doesn't require consent from an owner to designate a property either individually or as part of a heritage conservation district. Um, further to that, we're actually not required, we're actually not allowed to request or require consent from an owner. Um, so this was in, um, uh, this was decided by an Ontario uh, Superior Court case in 2003. Um, so the name of that court case is Tremblay versus Lakeshore, and the court found that it was um, in opposition to the intent of the act to request or require consent. Um, so just keeping that in mind, um, obviously it's, it's better if property owners are on board, um, but that is probably not always going to be the case, uh, particularly with this direction uh, where we're going to be more actively looking at designating properties. Um, so consideration must be based solely on whether or not a pro property fulfilled the criteria under Ontario Regulation 906. Uh, that is what staff in the Municipal Heritage Committee will be looking at, and that is what our recommendations will be based on. Uh, these designations are being undertaken in response to Bill 23. They're at provincial direction. We probably would not be pursuing them um, if it wasn't for that direction, um, but we are required to do so. So I suspect that we may end up getting into some objections from owners, um, and there is a clearly outlined process under the Act for Objections. Um, and we will need to follow it. Um, those objections, they're first heard by council. Um, so if an owner does not want a property to be designated, uh, they are able to come forward to council um, in a formal capacity through the processes in the act. Um, council can hear that um, and it can then escalate to the Ontario Land Tribunal. Next slide. Um, so just looking at this in kind of a broader policy context, uh, our provincial and local land use planning policies do require that the city identify, evaluate, and conserve its significant heritage resources. Um, that includes the provincial policy statement, the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, and the Corth Lakes official plan. Um, it was updated in 2017 uh, with an official plan amendment to include some strength in cultural heritage policies. Um, and the policies through all those three uh, policy pieces, they do align and direct the city um, to protect heritage properties. Um, previously, uh, in order to do this, we had taken a much lighter approach. Um, we focused on listing um, to identify and preserve those properties with designation when and where it was warranted, um, often an owner request, or if uh, something was relevant through the planning process. Um, we're now being directed to take a much more aggressive approach. Um, this is a, a substantial change for the city. Um, and it is going to mean a lot more designations coming forward and potentially a lot more objections from property owners. Um, so the heritage program will look a little bit different going forward, um, but we do need to, uh, to work within the provincial direction and fulfill our obligations under provincial policy. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm just gonna end off with a few little work plan items, just so council has a, a high level overview of what's coming forward. Um, so we're just at the end of Q1 right now. Um, so the first thing you're gonna be seeing, obviously, is this, this presentation. 
Um, but we do have the city owned property designations in this agenda. Uh, we'll also bring forward individual property listings as required. Um, and there has already been one of those in the January council agenda. Um, looking forward to Q2, uh, there will be amendments to the heritage application policy coming forward. And there's also a number of associated bylaws um, that help enact that policy. And those amendments will be coming forward at the same time. So those will all come forward as one package. Um, the amendments to the old mill HCD study, they will also come forward for council review and approval. Um, there will also, this is also when individual designations are going to start coming forward for non-city owned properties. Um, so you will see those throughout Q2 as well as uh, required individual property listings. Um, you may or may not see any of those. It just depends on uh, what sort of planning applications are coming through the door um, or on the horizon. Next slide. Um, looking forward to Q3 and Q4, uh, those designations and individual property listings will continue. Um, also in Q3, uh, we're looking to bring forward the Heritage Conservation District and Cultural Heritage Landscape Strategies, which will hopefully integrate those amendments um, and new regulations that the province is coming forward with. And in Q4, four, sorry, we will <laughs> start looking at a recommendation regarding the Bob Cajun Market Square Heritage Conservation District. Um, so that's an end of the year type item, but we will start looking at our future HCD development and we'll be starting in Bob Cajun. Next slide. Um, so just looking at 2024 and beyond, uh, some of those items will continue, uh, including the designation of listed properties um, and listing properties on a case by case basis. Um, we will also have to bring forward a strategy to address what to do with listed properties that are not designated by the end of 2024. Um, ideally, we would like them to continue to have some sort of heritage protection or recognition. Um, how that is going to look, I don't know. Um, but we've got 18 months to figure that out. So uh, expect that to come forward at some point late next year. Um, additional rec HCD recommendations, those are probably well beyond the 2024 horizon, um, but they will come forward at some point in the future. Um, the pol any policy amendments related to HCD amendment and repeal processes, because we don't have that regulation yet. I don't know what this looks like, um, but that will come forward when and if it's required. Um, Similarly, we may also require additional amendments to our heritage applications policy, um, some amendments made to the Planning Act. Um, now allow the prescription of regulations related to what kind of securities um, municipalities can charge for. We are currently, uh, through our heritage applications policy, able to charge security for conservation related items. Um, which we may not be allowed to do. So if that comes up, the heritage application policy will come forward again. Um, and also just looking at the, the very long term and some uh, some potential items for uh, for helping out with heritage conservation. Um, there's uh, the potential for using community planning permit systems uh, to implement heritage specific development standards, um, including heritage specific development standards or overlays in our urban zoning bylaws when that comes forward. Um, and also strengthening our official plan policies when we get to an update our, of our official plan. Uh, so some of these are for next year, some of these are for five or 10 years down the road, um, but just something to put in your mind while you're thinking about how we address heritage over the next number of years. And that's it. Well, thank you very much. Um, I just have a quick suggestion. Why don't we receive the presentation and save our questions for the report, which is following next on the agenda. Okay, so at this time that the presentation by Emily Turner, Economic Development Officer, Heritage Planning regarding Bill 23, Heritage Impacts be received and that this recommendation be brought forward to council for consideration at the next regular council meeting. Can I have a first and second? We have Councillor Smeaton, Councillor Yo, all in favor? And that's passed. Okay, so let's move into report, uh, Bill 23, Heritage Impacts and Designation Priorities. Emily, if you want to do a little update or just looking for questions at this time? Uh, the report essentially uh, goes into a little bit more detail about what I said in the presentation. So it's it's effectively the same content. So I figured it was, but I just thought in case there was something different. Thank you. So let's start with some questions. Councillor Smeaton. Thank you uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. Just really briefly. Um, Two council meetings ago, Chris Hanley came and we were able to pass that. Initially, the, it had been suggested that that be a heritage site, the handy old Hanley Lumber Building. Um, they didn't want that. We approved that that was, in fact, not going to happen. 
Um, now reading this between the lines, there's no risk that these people, like there will be no grandfathering back from us and now saying, well, actually now we could designate that building because we don't need the consultation of the homeowner. Is this sort of a starts now thing or that, that wouldn't be happening, would it? No. So we're not going to be going back on any decisions that we've already made. Um, with the process regarded to ha regarding Handley Lumber, um, if somebody came forward with an objection to any of the processes that have been outlined um, in the PowerPoint, the objection processes that exist are will continue. Um, so if somebody, for example, wanted to object to a designation or a listing, they can continue with the objection process. It comes to council in the same way that it would before. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Warren? For you. Um, thanks for your uh, presentation, Emily. Um, you were talking about the two years. Is that, I, I misunderstood, I think, um, you said it wasn't a hard and fast two years, like there was some wiggle room there? For th yes, so it's, um, so how it has been framed by the province is that, so the Ontario Heritage Act regulations came into effect on January 1st of this year. Um, which started the clock ticking on our listed properties, which so two years from January 1st, uh, so the beginning of 2025, um, all of our listed properties will be removed from the register automatically. Um, so in the meantime, the province has directed us um, in those two years to review our heritage res registers and designate whatever we want. However, there's no prohibition against designating stuff after those two years are up unless a Planning Act application comes forward for it. Okay. So if we were to not designate something and a Planning Act application came forward in, say, February 2025, Council wanted to designate that property, it couldn't. Thank you. And just uh, another quick question um, for the uh, Heritage uh, Conservation District. How long in... How long does it usually take to get everybody together to, to actually have it finished? So you're, you're starting in Bob Cajun at Market Square. How long would that process usually take? Probably three or four years. Um, so at the moment, we're working on the Old Mill Heritage Conservation District study. I'm anticipating it will probably be done by the end of this year, but we started that in 2020. So um, I think that's a realistic timeline. So that's three and a half years from the time that it was started um, to when the final designation will be brought forward by council for consideration. Thank you, uh, Councillor McDonald. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Chair. Uh, and thank you, Emily, for uh, presentation. You're very knowledgeable and, and uh, very excited about that. And that's good to see. I, I, have, a, I have a few questions and they're kind of, I was writing them down as many as I could when you were going through your presentation, but I want to start off with uh, residents. Uh, I understand, okay, somebody wants to have their house uh, registered as heritage. They have to go follow the rules. We've already uh, um, approved a few of them in January. I understand that process. Um, I want to talk about the process of what happens. Are you going to be going out and designating an area of four or five blocks, all heritage, and knowing that maybe there might be a bunch of houses in there that aren't heritage, is that, is that going to happen? Um, not really. So with regard to heritage conservation districts, uh, so the areas that we've identified as potential heritage conservation districts, yes, those will include um, more than one property, um, but they'll be very targeted properties. So for example, uh, just using the Bob Cajun Market Square example, that's a very small area. Um, most of the buildings are historic. It'll probably only encompass a dozen properties. Um, in terms of individual designation, it will be targeted specifically at heritage properties that are already identified on the heritage register. Um, so individual designation will not touch on any non-historic properties, and it also won't touch on anything that's not already identified on the register. Okay, that's that's interesting. So, so right now, if there's properties in an area right now that aren't designated heritage, um, you aren't going to have a bunch of group of people going out there and saying, "Hey, I think that's heritage," and say, "You know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make that house uh, heritage." That's correct. We're not doing that. You aren't going to do that. Okay. Well, that answers all um, pretty well all the other questions <laughs> I had. Uh, I appreciate. It. Does it cost any any money for to uh, every two years to make an application or so on? No. So, with regard to costs for um, heritage designation. 
for the property owner, there aren't any specific costs associated with it. So designated properties are required to apply for heritage permits when they want to make alterations to their property, but we don't charge fees for heritage permits um, because it, it's not really fair to make heritage properties pay more than a regular property if, if they want to put on a deck or something like that. Um, so they don't incur additional fees for that. Um, with regards to city costs, uh, we do have uh, to pay for the registration of bylaws and the provision of public notices, but those are already integrated into existing city budgets. Is there anything uh, in Bill 23 or anything that, uh, let's say there is a property that's not designated heritage at this time, um, and it's a fairly big piece of property, and somebody plans in the future maybe to take that building down, um, and it's not designated heritage is that an issue is that something that you can step in and say well this is a house that's 200 years old and and uh you know can you designate it heritage at that time that depends on what they've requested so if a planning act application comes in for a property and it is not listed on the heritage register we cannot um designate that property while the planning act application is in process if somebody just comes forward for a demolition permit if council would like to designate that property and they can do it and it will void the demolition permit. Council has a wide latitude of what they are allowed to designate under the Ontario Heritage Act. If it fulfills the criteria and there's no um, conditions with regard to planning applications, then you can designate whatever you want. Okay, and my last question then is, is it, it sounds like uh, council has a lot of uh, weight with this uh, approving and not approving. Um, can somebody uh, appeal somebody else's decision? Like uh, if I was a neighbor, can I appeal? Yes. So there are third party appeals allowed on certain heritage matters. Um, so for example, if you, if council had a heritage designation come forward and council decided to approve that designation, the property owner could appeal it um, or any third party could also appeal it. And that appeal could go to council or it could go to the Ontario Land Tribunal. If council chooses not to designate a property for whatever reason, um, there is no appeal mechanism for that. Okay, and I'm talking mostly uh, residential. Is, is that that's the same same laws that go for that? Yeah. So all the rules that apply for residential properties apply to institutional properties or commercial properties. Um, it doesn't matter. A, a heritage building is a heritage building is a heritage building. Okay. Uh, council probably won't see very many residential properties coming forward as part of this process. Okay, thank you, uh, Emily. Thank you, Councillor Joyce. Uh, thank you to you, Madam uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just a clarification on a, a point here. I've been looking for a bullet point, and I sense it's just a, you'll, your answer will be a bylaw amendment, but um, the new act says no restrictions on these properties with regard to alterations. I turn the page and it says, designated property owner must apply for a heritage permit to make certain types of alterations. So <laughs> with the new act, is alterations permitted on a heritage building going forward and we have to change our own bylaw? Is that the answer or? Sorry, which part of the report is this in? I'm just gonna look, just look at it to see what I've actually written. Uh, it's on page 36 of our, of, our, of the, what we're looking at in 37. Sorry, I'm just... Uh... Or page 2 of 12 on the Bill 23 Heritage Impacts and Designation Priorities and page 3 of 12. Okay. All right. So, um, so listed properties do not require a heritage permit, whereas individual properties do require a heritage permit. Nothing has changed in that respect. Um, uh, with regard to permitting. There's actually no changes permitting wise um, in the amendments to the act. So listed properties don't have to apply for permits. Heritage designated properties do have to apply for permits. That's, I'm, I'm not sure where you're looking in the report, but that's the, that is the answer to, to the permitting issue. Okay, help me here though. Does that, what does that mean with regard to alterations? Um, so if a, the owner of a designated property would like to make all certain kinds of alterations to their property, generally we define those as ones that require building permits, so not maintenance or anything like that, uh, they're required to apply for and receive a heritage permit. 
Um, so we have our heritage permit application form. Um, it's reviewed uh, by staff. If it's something substantial, it, sometimes it comes to council. Usually it doesn't. Um, and once they receive their heritage permit, they can go and do that work, similar to getting building permit. Um, only designated properties need to get heritage permits, though. So listed properties, if they want to put on a new deck or something, they only have to get a building permit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I don't see any other questions at this time. Um, Emily, just curious. I know you've had a lot of dialogue with other heritage groups out there who've been asking for an update on our Bill 23. Are you able to share this report with some of those folks and connections that you have out there? Yes, absolutely. I can circulate this information to anyone who's interested. That's great, because I know there, it's a lot of heavy lifting that you had to do to kind of, you know, expose everything that we need to know. So thanks for doing that. So at this time, I'll take uh, that the report ED 2023-005, Bill 23 Heritage Impact Impacts and Designation Priorities be received for information and that this recommendation be brought forward to Council for consideration at the next regular Council meeting. So can I get a first and second? We got Mayor Elmsley, Councillor Joyce, all in favor, and that's passed. Okay, it's 2.40, let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, 10.50, be back here and on the dot, thanks.
Okay, folks, we're back online, so let's get back to it. Uh, we're going into reports 7.1, license agreement between the City of Kortha Lakes and the Hickory Beach Docks Association. I was wondering if we have a staff member on that would can give us a, just a quick update. Okay, we have Ms. Dyer there, so if you're all set to go, let's let it rip. All right. Uh, so at the council meeting of November 16th, 2021, council reviewed the encroachment bylaw 2018-017 and the docking policy 2018-001 and pursuant to resolution CR 2021-558 adopted the revised dock encroachment policy uh, CP 2021-047 this policy allows for the licensing of docks on city shoreline road allowances subject to certain conditions and sets out the procedure for this um, approval. When conditions to the approval have been met, the approval for a five year term will be issued. Conditions are laid out in report in the report and include things such as um, the use has to not adversely affect others and sets out with and spacing and location and fees, uh, among other things. Uh, the city uh, owns parcels of land, owns a parcel of land just north of Hickory Beach at the terminus of Pleasant Point Road in the former township of Verulam. These lands were, uh, although they resemble a shoreline road allowance, they were given to the city from a private individual for parkland. Um, the for parkland use so residents of the neighboring subdivision comprise approximately 200 owners and the hickory beach dock As uh, owners association is comprised of 50 uh, 50 people that currently have privately owned docks uh, on this strip of land the city also owns uh, two uh, common water access blocks in this area uh, at the north end of Park Hill Drive. Uh, as of 2018, six docks were located here uh, on that on the extra uh, piece. So this so um, in 2017, the Hickory Beach Dock Association uh, required a license to self regulate requested a self oh my goodness <laughs> requested a license to self regulate the docks in the area. Uh, the larger Hickory Beach Association can, were canvassed and they did not object. Following that, the city entered into an agreement with the Hickory Beach Dock Owners Association. The association was responsible for the maintenance as well as for obtaining all the permits required by Kortha Conservation Authority and Trent Severn Waterway that were required to, and they're also required to maintain insurance. Uh, in March, on March 23rd, 2021, after a deputation by a member of Hickory Beach Dock Association that were that was in opposition to the agreement, council made a resolution to have this brought back for discussion before the renewal. So the re uh, they required the request to terminate the current agreement and license docks in this area uh, or our recommendation. Sorry. Uh, as it's in, as it's in, as it is consistent to the city's approach to the historical licensing of dock encroachments in other areas such as Thurstonia and Cedar Glen, local resident and member of the Hickory Beach Dock Owners Association has raised concerns that the association may be assigning multiple docks to some uh, residents and certain high high standing members might be expanding docks, thereby contravening the dock encroachment policy. Well, the recommendation is uh, to ensure transparency to the process and potentially offers more uniformity and treatment of all individual dock owners. So in terms of cost, although it appears to increase the revenue to the city, it would be offset by the staff administration costs. The possible dock fees are insufficient even for recovery, resulting in taxpayers subsidizing private docks. So I don't know if I was clear there, but that was the recommendation that the city would administer the docks. So um, the other alternative would be to renew the existing agreement for five year term 
which would reduce staff costs, but would be inconsistent with other areas and leaves the city unable to enforce key areas of the dock encroachment policy. So if anybody has any questions. Thank you for that uh, update. I'm just looking for questions right now. We have Mayor Almsley. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. And through you to uh, Ms. Dyer. Um, our costs would increase if we took it back. And I'm also wondering what would happen to, uh, if we took it back, would the people who have the docks now still have them, or would it become a free-for-all and anybody could apply? So through Madam Deputy Mayor to you, um, Yes, our costs would increase, but so would the revenue because then the dock fees would be coming to us, which we don't currently receive. Um, and I'm sorry, could you repeat the second part of the question? Would the people who currently have docks and have had them for years and years, would they still retain them or would it get thrown open so anyone could apply? So I think that we would um, follow like the, the regular process in the two policies that I cited. So we would look at our nor normally how we would deal with the dock encroachment policy. And I my assumption is that we would license the ones that were already there, but we would have the same requirements. So there would only be one dock per home. Um, and I would think uh, it would be up to council to decide how we would go about that, but it could be similar to Cedar Glen where the existing docks were the ones that got licensed, um, but also pursuant to the restriction of one dock per home. Thank you for that um, through you, um, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, my inclination is uh, to renew this for a two-year period and have the Dock Owners Association report back um, by April 2025 regarding the experience for the two years and any issues raised during that time and any outstanding issues and also to remove any encroachments because I met with the Dock Owners Association last year and they assured me that the encroachments had been removed and uh, so I, I would like that as to be included in there and I'm just it would uh, uh, your group um, support or uh, go along with uh, such a motion I think that's to you, uh, Ms. Dyer. I'm sorry. Thank you. I, I just, I wasn't sure who you were speaking to, so I didn't answer. Um, yes, if that's the motion, our, our, my group will definitely support that, and we can compile that report for review. Thank you. Okay, let's hold that motion. We've got four other councillors with questions. So, uh, Councillor Ashmore. Thank you, Madam Deputy Chair. To Sherry. Um, just two quick questions. Um, when you're dealing with these situations, you have associations and then you have the city that's taking over, and it's really difficult to have two people, two entities in charge. How does this work here when you have an association, which is which are great? I mean, we, we, we deal with lots of um, associations. Um, I'm just looking back at Cedar Glen. When Cedar Glen was made proactively, made into a... Uh, it was part of the docking process. I have over 250 dock spaces at least in Ward 6, so had a bit of experience the last few years. Um, how how is that um, how does that work? Like, who's in charge? Basically, is the city in charge, or is, is are we giving the association um, management? So basically, what I'm asking is who man, who is managing it? Because it's with Cedar Glen, they tried the private system. But it really didn't work out too well because a lot of people were peeved off because they 
they were, they were going to lose their dock space because a, a private group of people would have controlled the whole lakefront and they would never have gotten their, their space, which they had for many years. So I'm just wondering how this will work in the specific uh, Hickory Beach area, whether it will be the, the city in charge or will the association still have some management in it. So through you, Deputy Mayor, to the Councillor, uh, currently it is the Dock Owners Association that's um, responsible for managing the area for maintenance and for um, dock, um, any dock issues. Uh, what we are recommending is that that would be changed to the city starting to uh, manage the docks in that area. Okay, and then the final question is because it's it is related because it's in part of the package here. The Cedar Glen, you know, we have um, Thurstonia, which has over 200 docks, and they have they have the ability. Every one of those, whether they live a back lot or they live on near the waterfront, they have the ability to transfer their lease when they down the road decide they have to sell their property. Um, whereas in in Cedar Glen, only half of them can sell their can transfer their their lease. Like I, I've got a memo coming to council next month just to to correct that in, in inequality there. But um, will this be the case in Hickory Beach, where the existing lease owners will be able to transfer their lease to the next owner? So, for you, Deputy Mayor, to the Councillor, uh, nothing is in place right now. But my um, thought is that it would be open to transferring, that it wouldn't be the, a one and done sort of thing. Um, okay, thanks. That's, that's good. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, that's good. We'll discuss this next month with Cedar Glen, but that's, thanks for your answer. Thank you, uh, Councillor McDonald. Yes, uh, thank you uh, through you, uh, Deputy uh, Chair. Um, so if we renew this for another two years, as the mayor suggests, my question is, um, how do we make sure um, that it's fair and honest? And who is going to manage that? Because it sounds like uh, people in charge are doing what they want to do and making the rules for themselves. I really think that we should be responsible for making some rules. People have been there for 32 years or longer or whatever. And I don't even know the area of the situation. I'm just looking at the at the issues here of how do we, how does the city manage to make sure it stays fair and honest? So through you, Deputy Mayor, to the councillor, I, I would think if we could get a list of the members of the Hickory Beach Dock Owners Association, then we could look into the ownership of homes in the area and, and have the number of homes match the people that are in the Dock Owners Association because they are different individuals than the, the, all the owners in the subdivision. Um, and we could go forward from there. Okay, thank you. And I think that's very important as we go forward too, is that, you know, um, if we're going to renew something for two years, we should make sure that it's done properly and that we aren't uh, sitting uh, back in two months from now, people complaining, but they don't have a spot um, on their docks. But anyway, that's just a comment. And uh, if we could do that, then I would, uh, I would actually uh, support that for two years if that could be done. Great. Thank, thank you. Great. Thank you. We have four more councillors that want to weigh in. So, Councillor Warren. Thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so, this is just, um, this is the only issue that's really popped up um, with this group because I think it's been managed pretty well over the years. And uh, so is, is this the only thing that's happened in the last while that uh, with this Hickory Beach group? Because it's been, it's been run pretty well for quite a few years now and it's unfortunate that this is happening. I, I, um, I think it's a good idea. I will support the uh, um, mayor's uh, resolution. But is this the only uh, issue that has popped up in the last few years? So through the deputy mayor to the councillor, 
Um, this is the only issue that I have awareness of, but I don't have access to the complaints or the issues that have been raised with uh, the bylaw um, group and the email or with the um, the actual people, the DOC association managing the area right now um, that would be possibly called on to rectify issues. This is the only one that I currently have uh, information with respect to, but I cannot say that this is the only issue that has come up. Okay, are we good? All right, then we'll move to Councillor Perry. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I had a chance to do some homework before this resolution uh, was coming forward as I hadn't heard hide nor hair of, of, uh, of a problem or an issue until I saw it on the uh, the agenda for today. Um, I spoke with uh, the acting president, the president's out of town right now, of the association, uh, who conveyed to me that they, you know, the other 49 dock owners haven't had a problem or an issue. Um, I really favor community decisions being made or community governance being done by communities as much as possible, keeping those things in community hands. Um, I think it would be a shame to see the association, all the work they've done, uh, come apart um, because of you know an issue with a um, with a uh, with an encroachment, I really do feel for the that owner though, and uh, we need to go and see what's been done and what hasn't been done, and I can undertake to do that before next council meeting. Um, but I think that uh, you know I would definitely support the uh, the mayor's motion and uh, two five years. That's uh, that's fine with me. I don't want two. It, well, if I could, if I can, uh, I would like to, maybe we could keep the two or five open for now because I could check with the association and get more information in terms of whether this has been rectified or not. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Councillor Joyce. Uh, thank you, Madam De Deputy Mayor, and through you, um, um, I guess I'm kind of sitting on the fence here a bit, listening to great comments from um, Councillor McDonald, Perry, and Warren. Um, my question is, I, I'm a big fan of consistency. Uh, Thurstonia and Cedar Glen, we manage. Are there other examples where docks like this scenario are also association managed? So through the Deputy Mayor to the Councillor, we have some different areas. We have uh, an area um, on uh, I think it's tree wood where somebody has a dock that has been privately built uh, and it's open for public use, but privately insured. Um, and then we have many single docks throughout the city that have been licensed uh, as well. So there are some different ways that we deal with docks. Um, Thank you. It sounds like those would be individual ownership Docks or licensed docks by individuals. Is there another group of docks managed by an association similar to this one? So, through the deputy mayor to the councillor, uh, this is the only one that I'm aware of where it's a, a an association managing a, an area of several docks. Okay, thank you. I'm, I. I'm leaning in favor of Mayor Elmsley's proposal, but at the two-year mark. Uh, it's only one problem that's arisen, so I don't think it's a matter to uh, go completely in, in another direction, but it's also a, a tighter time frame to make sure that this one problem does go away, I think is necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Yeo. Thank you, and uh, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, and I agree, it's a, it's it's probably a good motion. Um, I look at uh, the the photographs of the Barbosas have uh, have supplied in the um, and although it's one problem, it's the start of a problem, and it's going to what you call dock creep. And next thing you know, there's going to be a wooden boardwalk halfway down the shore if this problem isn't rectified now. And um, these basically storage areas, platforms, um, turtle sandboxes, everything right at the waterfront, 
two sea dues and a boat and boat lifts and and occupying all this space, um, it's going to be dock creep and it, and it's going to be it's going to be it's going to grow and it's going to it's going to be a bigger problem down the road. So, so I will support the motion, but this has to be rectified for these people because it's just the start of of a bad situation, and that's why I like the two years because if it doesn't get rectified, then there's no way two years from now it should be renewed at all. Thank you. Thank you. And I have no other questions at this time. I'm just going to read back your motion, Mayor Amsley. Okay. That the agreement between the City of Cortha Lakes and the Hickory Beach Dock Owners Association be renewed for two years. The association reports back by April 2025 on the issues over the last two years. That these recommendations be brought forward to Council for consideration at the next regular Council meeting. And also, I have to have uh, the report needs to be received first. So, do I have a first and second on that? Councillor Perry, Councillor Ashmore, all in favor? Okay, thank you. So, do I have a seconder on Mayor Almsley, or do you want to speak to it? I just wanted to say that included in that is removal of all encroachments. And yes, I will uh, speak to it if I may. The um, this was an experiment. And they came forward, they got together, they came forward, they went to the Hickory Beach Association. The association, as, as Sherry pointed out, had no objections to them going forward in this way. And it, it was to be kind of a template that could be used in other areas if it were successful. So I think it has, for the most part, been successful. When I, I met with the, um, uh, the Dock Owners Association, I believe it was last year, 2022, it may have been late 2021, and they, I knew about the encroachment and I asked about it and they told me at that time that the encroachment had been removed. Now, if it hasn't been removed, I think it needs to be removed, as do all the other uh, impediments down there. So I think putting it in the motion that the encroachments have to be um, handled kind of speaks to that problem. Then making it for two years and having them come back with a report on any issues that have occurred during the two years and any outstanding issues means that this council and not the next council, uh, because we now have the history of it, uh, gets to deal with it. And if things are clean and everything's good, then we can uh, approve it for a five-year period at that point. And if it's not, we can take other action. So that's the reason why I broached the two-year period, and I want to put the onus on the dock owners to come back to council if they want this agreement to uh, continue. So uh, I hope you support the motion. I, I think it makes sense. And uh, it means that we're not going to throw the onus back on the city. And as you've heard and you see in the report, it could end up costing us more money in the end than we receive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you want me to just read it back one more time for clarification? Okay. That the agreement between the City of Corth Lakes and the Hickory Beach Dock Owners Association be renewed for two years. The association report back to Council by April 2025 on the, any issues in, the next, in those two years. Also, with the removal of all encroachments. So can this end and the report oh, be? I already did that. <laughs> okay. So uh, I have uh, Mayor Amsley and the seconder by Councillor Warren. Uh, all in. Oh, do you have a council? If I could, just a point of clarification in the motion language that mentions report back issues, issues related to the encroachment. I'm assuming correct. Any issues that have arisen during the two years, and any outstanding issues. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have a first and a second. All in favor? And that's passed. Thank you.
Okay, moving on to uh, 7 2, proposed surplus declaration closer sale of portions of road alliances adjacent to 80 Ellis Street, Fenland Falls. So, just a quick recap. Thank you, Sherry Dyer. Okay, so the land management team received a request from owners of property uh, municipally known as Ellis Street, Fenland Falls, to purchase two road allowances adjacent to their property. LMT reviewed and had no objections. This was on July 11th, 2022. Uh, the owner subsequently submitted a second application requesting to purchase a portion of South Street, which is also adjacent to their property. Uh, the land management team reviewed this on November 28th and denied it due to the fact that it would landlock several privately owned properties. Upon receiving notice of the denial, the applicant submitted documentation showing that they own all of the properties that LMT had concerns with and would that they would be landlocked. So accordingly, uh, land management team re-reviewed it and had no objections. Um, uh, so advertising occurred for three consecutive weeks in February of 2023. Realty services did not receive any comments or uh, concerns. Uh, land management team determined that these portions of road allowance were not required for municipal purposes. While the applicant originally wanted to purchase the entire length of South Street from Ellis uh, to the Victoria Rail Trail, land management team noted that portions containing the trail must be retained by the city as an active trail. Uh, further, land management team determined that a portion between Green Street and Ellis should be retained in order to maintain a public connection for water infrastructure. Applicant advised the land management was advised of the land management team decision and confirmed their interest in proceeding with the sale as proposed by the team. Uh, the applicant owns the adjacent land, so the road allowance can be conveyed to them. The subject road allowance does not lead to water. Therefore, it does not contravene Section 8 of the bylaw, uh, bylaw 2018-020. The land management team re recommends setting the value at the higher of the appraised value or the set of or, or set value of or the set value of $15 per linear foot. Uh, the other alternative is council could decide not to sell, which would be inconsistent with past practice and is not recommended. Uh, council could decide not to require an appraisal, which is not recommended, given the fact that council has expressed concern that the city is not capitalizing on disposal of surplus property. The appraisal ensures the city is obtaining the best price for the property and creates a transaction that, while still beneficial to the purchaser, is also beneficial to the taxpayer. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Great. Well, um, oh, Councillor Perry. It was more really just a, a statement on what uh, the report had mentioned in that um, I haven't received any uh, questions or comments on this uh, proposed sale except for one, which was simply for informational purposes, they were, you know, out of curiosity. Perfect. So, committee, what would you like to do? You have the recommendation in front of you. Mayor Almsley? Move as printed. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Smeaton? All in favor? And that's passed. Okay, so we'll move on to seven point, hang on here, three. Proposed surplus declaration closure and sale a portion of road adjacent to part lot 20, concession three, Cardin. Quick update again, thank you, Manager Dyer. All right, so the land management team received a recommendation or a request from the owner of part lot 20, concession three, Cardin, to purchase a portion of road allowance which was adjacent to their property. Uh, the land management team reviewed this on July 11th, uh, 2022 at their meeting and had no objections. The advertising was completed for three consecutive weeks in February of 2023. Realty services received no comments or concerns. Land management team recommends that the subject property be declared surplus to municipal needs and approval be given in principle for closure and sale of the requested portion of the road allowance to the adjacent landowner. The land management team has determined 
the portion of road allowance is not required for municipal purposes, particularly given the subject property is only accessible via private road. The applicant owns a property which borders the road allowance so it can be conveyed to them pursuant to bylaw 2018-020. The subject road allowance does lead to water. Uh, however, the southern portion was al has already been approved for sale to the adjacent landowners. Uh, regardless of whether the sale is finalized, it would not result in a loss of public access to water, given that it is only accessible via a private road, uh, Whipperwill Lane and Loon Drive, and all parties that access via that private road are waterfront properties. Uh, as two small portions of the subject road allowance intersect with private roads, Whipperwill and Loon Drive, which are owned by the applicant, there will be a condition within the agreement of purchase and sale noted, noting that these sections will be subject to an easement allowing passage for all those entitled to pass over private road. Uh, land management team recommends selling for the increase of the $15 linear foot or the appraised value uh, other options are that council might decide not to sell, which is inconsistent with past practice, or they could decide not to recommend an appraisal, which is not recommended given that council has expressed concern that the city is not capitalizing on the disposal of surplus property. An appraisal ensures that the city will be obtaining the best price for the buyer and for the taxpayer. And if anybody has any questions. Thank you. Uh, committee, what would you like to do? You have a recommendation in front of you. Go ahead, Councillor Smeaton. I'll recommend we move it as printed. Okay. Do I have a seconder? Councillor, oh, Councillor Yo, do you have a question or are you a seconder? Um, a question and a second. Okay, well, you second it and then uh, we'll okay. ask for questions before we vote. How's that? That sounds good. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm, my question is um, in regards to um, an appraisal on this particular piece of property $14,000 for uh, basically a landlocked piece of, of road allowance owned on both sides by the by the uh, purchaser. Is it not? Is that correct? Is it a, both, both sides of the road is owned by the same person? Uh, through the councillor, through the, <laughs> through the deputy mayor to the councillor. Um, yes, so on both, like on both sides, yes, it's owned by the applicant. And how much does an appraisal typically cost? The appraisal cost varies depending on the parcel of land. And it's, yeah, it's part of the disposition bylaw to get an appraisal. I understand that, but one of the uh, alternatives <laughs> is we could, council could choose not to get an appraisal. So that'd be, that would be what, waiving the bylaw? That portion of it? Correct. I believe that's what you would do if you wanted to do that. Okay, I just put it out there because appraisals and, and for a piece of land like this and appraisals are um, in many instances in this situation anyway, um, to me a waste of money, but um, somebody can, I don't know. Um, I'm still, I still seconded it so and just put it out there. Thank you. Thank you, and I don't see any other questions at this time, so all in favor, we have the motion on the table. Okay, all approved. Is that? I just had a question if he was asking for that to be a friendly, that that be waived, the bylaw. Oh, okay. It was good, he seconded it, so we're good to go. All right, let's move on to report 7.4, proposed surplus declaration closure and sale of a portion of road allowance between 447 and 451 Cambrai Road. Cambrai, so this was one that we did hear from two deputations earlier in the agenda. So if you want to just give us a quick overview, Manager Dyer, that'd be awesome. The land management team received a request from the owner of the property municipally known as 447 Cambrai Road, Cambrai, to purchase a portion of the road allowance adjacent to their property. The land management team reviewed the request at their meeting uh, on March 14th, 2022 and on May 9th, 2022 and had no objections. <clears throat> the team was of the opinion that the owner of 451 Cambrai Road should be contacted to determine their level of interest 
of interest in purchasing a portion of the road allowance adjacent to their property, as it is standard practice to offer all adjacent landowners the option to purchase. While reviewing the request to purchase, the land management team noted a number of encroachments on the road allowance. Accordingly, initially, the team offered to split the road in such a way as to ensure all encroachments would belong to would be to 447 would become part of their property upon the sale. Uh, 451 advised they would prefer a more equitable split as this is in alignment with the standard practice, uh, which is to offer half the road allowance to each adjacent landowner and encroachments. And these encroachments are unauthorized, meaning they're not permitted by a license agreement. Staff is requesting or is recommending that the road allowance be split in half between the two adjacent owners. Uh, the owners of 447 have been notified and advised they would prefer uh, the initial split as this would allow their encroachments to remain in their current locations. Uh, advertising has uh, been completed for three consecutive weeks in February of 2023. Realty services recommends or received no concerns or comments. The land management team um, recommends that the subject property be declared surplus to municipal needs and approval be given in principle for closure and sale of the required portion of the road allowance to the adjoining landowners. Uh, the portion of the road allowance is not required for municipal purposes. The potential purchaser's own property that borders on the subject uh, piece of road allowance. The subject portion does lead to a creek, so it could be considered a road allowance leading to water. However, the creek runs exclusively through private property and is not considered to be a navigable waterway. The city has an easement uh, over the private property, which would allow access to the creek if maintenance is required. The land management team recommends setting the value at the higher of $15 per linear foot or the appraised value. Uh, the other alternatives available are that council could decide not to sell, which is inconsistent with past practice. Um, council could decide to sell according to the first proposal, uh, which is laid out in Appendix D to this report, uh, which would ensure that all encroachments belonging to the owners of 447 Cambrai would be located on their property at closing. If council proceeds with this option, uh, we would recommend that costs be split according to the percentage that each purchaser will be um, gaining, which is a 75-25 split. Council could also decide not to re request require an appraisal, which is not recommended given that council has expressed concern that the city is not capitalizing on the disposal of surplus property. And an appraisal ensures that the city would be obtaining the best price for both the purchaser and the taxpayer. And if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you. And I see some hands popping up. But first, uh, what does committee want to do? You have the recommendation in front of you. Councillor Joyce. Yeah, I move that uh, we follow the staff recommendation of in past practice, current practice of a 50-50 split, the encroachments to be removed and the cost split also 50-50. Is there a seconder on that? Yeah. Councillor Yo, you got your hand up. Yeah, sorry, I did. Uh, I forgot to put it back down, but but since you you recognize me, I'm going to take advantage. And um, so, is the councillor just made the motion as printed? Is that in essence what I heard? Well, there's the staff offered different options there, and I'm choosing the one option where it's 50-50, as opposed to 75-25 or not selling at all. So what's your thoughts now, Councillor Yo? My thoughts are, I think that's what the motion says. Yes, well, that's it does. The option. Yes, oh, it does. Okay. Okay, that's the option. Yeah, yes, I'll second it, yeah. All right, so uh, before we go, uh, approve that or move forward, can, let's go through the questions here. Councillor Warren? Yes, for you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, uh, listening to Mr. Duguay, it, it kind of made sense. These folks brought it forward. 
it wouldn't have been happening, you know, the 50-50. Um, I, I won't support that. I, I liked his idea of, of maybe 60-40 is, is, is uh, to allow the encroachment also. It's a, it's a, a raised garden. It's, um, and I, I guess they might not have actually gone forward with this knowing that this is how it was going to turn out. So I will not support the uh, resolution on the floor. Okay, Councillor Ashmore. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. To Sh Sherry, um, just a question on this. Do we not have actually four owners and four property owners involved here? You have number 11 and number 455. <clears throat> just looking at page 132, you have a property owner to the south. Have they were obviously they were they were notified of this potential sale or merger of these two properties because would they not have an express interest in that property um, to the south of this? When I'm looking at the sketch here. So through the deputy mayor to the councillor. I believe the only two that are adjacent to the piece we're selling are the two that are involved here. So 447 and 451. Uh, the other property owners would have been notified by virtue of us placing the advertisements in the newspaper. But I believe these are the only two that are adjacent to the road allowance we're contemplating selling. Thanks. I just see another one to the south. But, oh. You good? Okay, Councillor Perry. Thanks very much. As I said, I was talking to the residents um, of both dwellings on Sunday afternoon. I thank them profusely for bringing this uh, challenging, difficult decision uh, to be made by us. Um, I, you know, I know that Mr. DeGay had talked about the enjoyment of the property with the garden and that kind of thing. Um, at the end of the day, though, that is on city land, and they are encroachments. And I, I want, you know, I wonder if we, you know, have a duty to make sure that we, uh, you know, don't reward <laughs> encroachments as a factor of our decision. Um, this is a tricky one, as I said, it's a difficult, you can see all sides, I'm sure. Um, so I tend to default back to what the past practice has been and what the recommendation is for these practices. And at this point, I'm leaning to the 50-50 split. Thank you, Mayor Elmsley. Well, Councillor Perry stole some of my thunder. Uh, I was going to say that um, if you encroach on city property, you do you should do so at your own peril, uh, because at any point in time we can ask you to remove your encroachment. So I don't think that should enter into uh, the decision, and I think we should stick with past practices. Thank you, Councillors Meaton. Everybody's stealing everybody's thunder tonight. Okay, so we do, oh, Councillor McDonald, your hands up. Uh, yes, I have to agree with uh, Mr. Uh, Perry. Um, it sounds like uh, a 50-50 split would be very reasonable and fair to both parties. Great, so we do have a motion for first and second. So with uh, move as uh, the, ro uh, the report recommends, so all in favor? And that passes. Okay. Oh, so 7.6. All right, so we'll move on to report 7.5, proposed surplus declaration, closure, and conveyance of a portion of the shoreline road allowance adjacent to 399 Black River Road. You're back on the spot there, Manager Dyer. So the land management team received a call from an owner of the property municipally known as 399 Black River Road to exchange or a request, sorry, uh, to exchange a portion of a forced road running through their property in, in, in exchange for the shoreline road allowance that's adjacent to their property. So the land management team reviewed this at the meeting on September 12th, 2022, and had no objections. Um, so the advertising occurred for three consecutive weeks in February of 2023. Uh, the Realty, Realty Services did not receive any concerns or comments. Um, land management team 
recommends the property be declared surplus to municipal needs and that approval be given in principle for the closure and conveyance of the requested portion in exchange for a portion of 399 Black River Road. Uh, shoreline road allowances exist on many lakes within the city of Kortha Lakes. And although they were many of them were never opened as public, public municipal roads, they remain public property. Recreational and residential property owners of lakefront property often do not own the property right to the water's edge. And in many places, the adjacent property owner has encroachments onto this space and utilizes it as a lot addition. In this area, various portions of the shoreline road allowance have already been stopped up and closed and conveyed to the adjoining landowners. Accordingly, the land management team determined that it would be appropriate to proceed with the um, stop up and and convey it to the adjacent landowner. Uh, the applicant property is currently made up of two separate parcels which are separated by Riley Creek. Given the location of Black River Road running through the properties, it is effectively four separate parcels travel of uh, travel <laughs> separated by the travel road east and west and Riley Creek north and south. Currently, uh, there's one building on the westernmost portion of the property north of Black River Road. Upon closing, uh, the property will come to be four separate parcels, will become four separate parcels. Um, the subject portion of the shoreline road allowance is also separated by Riley Creek and will merge with the two adjacent parcels to the north. So the Appendix D shows the resultant parcels post conveyance. Black River Road is a combination road, partially located on city owned property and partially located on private properties. The subject portion located on the private property, uh, subject portion is located on private property, property therefore fully maintained. Uh, however, it's fully maintained on a year round basis by the city. The portion to the immediate east in city ownership, uh, accordingly, the land management team determined the appropriate, it's appropriate to be in city ownership. Staff received the required request for appraisal, requirement for appraisal be waived and that the land be exchanged for nominal consideration. This would be in compliance with section 66 sub 1 sub 1 of the Municipal Act 2001, which states, that if before January 1st, 2003, a highway was opened uh, on land in place of all or part of an original road allowance and compensation was not paid for the land, the owner of the land uh, appro appro appropriately appropriated for highway or the successful title of the owner is entitled to the following. If that person owns the land abutting on the allowance, the owner is entitled to the soil and freehold of the original road allowance and to a conveyance of the original road allowance. The land management team also uh, recommends that the city pay for all costs associated with the transaction as part of compensation for the road having been built through the private property, presumably without costs being paid, uh, no record of same having been found pursuant to a, a record search. So council could decide not to approve this, but it's not recommended as this section of Black River Road is fully maintained by city staff and would be uh, beneficial to be in city ownership. Great, thank you. Okay. So we do uh, have committee, what would you like to do? We do have the recommendation in front of us at this time. Councillor Yo. I'll move it as printed. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Joyce. Any questions at this time? Oh, we have Mayor Elmsley. Just a couple of questions, thank you, through you, uh, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. Is this property subject to flooding? Does someone? Well, through through deputy, the Deputy Mayor to the Councillor, I'm unaware. I'm wondering okay. if uh, uh, Councillor Yo or perhaps uh, Director Robinson would know if it's subject to flooding. Well, once in a while, the uh, Black River does tend to 
Crescent Banks, as does the Gull River and the Bird River, but not on the uh, not as um, as often as as the Burt River for sure. Um, but considering the road we're taking ownership is well back from the shoreline, I think this is probably a good trade off if it does flood. <laughs> Thank you. The the other question I had, um, if one owner owns all four parcels, and I, I note it has a number 399 on it, uh, so those properties are already merged, or if he buys them, doesn't the, prop, doesn't the province automatically merge properties that are owned by the same person that are adjacent? So through the deputy mayor to the councillor, uh, properties merging depends on the provisions of the Planning Act. And uh, I'm not sure if this is property that would qualify for that. Um, but that's something we would determine upon looking at it. Thank you. Further. I, yeah, sorry. Thank you. I think Director Robinson, you want to chime in? Sure. Uh, thank you uh, through you, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor, to Council. Uh, the road that the city is looking to obtain through here is an existing uh, municipally assumed uh, maintained road. So right now the road allowance going through that property does not align with the location of the existing road. So this would be uh, an improvement in, in, this, in the fact that we're getting property where the road lies. Uh, so uh, through the Land Management Committee it was determined to be a, uh, an appropriate exchange uh, for that, uh, for obtaining that property that we should be owning already anyways. Uh, further to, to the question about the parcels, uh, they're not adjacent parcels. They are, uh, the road will be uh, segmenting or, or breaking the parcels east-west, as, uh, as Manager Dyer explained. And already the uh, creek running north-south through the property is on a separate uh, a pin, which would then also dissect the properties uh, north south. So uh, again, creating four separate independent parcels that are separated, not immediately adjacent to one another. Great, thank you. So we do have a first and second on the on the floor right now. Uh, recommendation as printed are all in favor. And that passes. Moving to report seven point six. Proposed surplus declaration closure and sale of portions of road allowance adjacent to 21 Blue Bay Lane, 31 Blue Bay Lane, and 79 Rainbow Road, Fenland Falls. And I think, Councillor Yo, you've procured your interest on this one. He has left. Okay. So, uh, Manager Dyer, can you just give us a quick update? Thank you. The land management team received a request from the owner of 21 Blue Bay Lane in Fenland Falls to purchase the road allowance adjacent to their property and reviewed this request uh, at their meeting on July 12th, 2021 and did not and did note that public access to the parcel appears limited given that the property is part of a condo and a travel and the traveled road uh, Blue Bay Lane is private and maintained by the condo corporation. Um, the only public access is off Highway 35 through an unimproved, untraveled uh, road allowance. However, the land management team felt that it would not support the sale because the road allowance leads to water and a title search revealed that the land had been specifically acquired in 2011 in order to maintain public access to Cameron Lake. Uh, the applicant then made the deputation uh, request. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, and so then the applicant made a deputation request after it was denied and council reconsidered the land management team's decision at the committee of the whole meeting on September 7th, 2021. The recommendation from that um, was that it was requested that staff review and report back by the end of the first quarter of 2022 Accordingly, Realty Services brought forward report uh, Realty Services 2021-048, which is attached as Appendix D to the report. 
uh, at the council meeting of December 14th, 2021, which outlined that the land, which outlined the land management team reasons for denying the request. Subsequently, on April 19th, 2022, Councillor, now Mayor Almsley, brought forward a memorandum uh, requesting that council consider approving the request given. Uh, the limited public access issue and liability issues created for the applicant when public use of the privately owned condo road to access the subject road allowance. At that meeting, Council adopted a resolution that the subject road allowance be de declared surplus. And as part of the disposition, uh, staff review all options with the adjoining landowners. So staff reached out to all the adjoining landowners. There were four in total. Uh, to inquire whether they were interested in purchasing, all confirmed that they were. Uh, the advertising occurred and Realty Services received no complaints or comments. Um, to own property that's within the condo, so that's 21 and 31 Blue Bay Lane. Accordingly, their acquired property will become part of their condo unit, units one and four respectively. Um, the remaining two properties, 79 Rainbow Road and part of Lot 26, Concession 8, will merge with the respective adjoining properties. Due to the inequitable, inequitable split of land, um, staff recommend that all costs that can be shared, so advertising, reference plan, and appraisals, be split according to the percentage of land each purchaser will be gaining. So that's a 40, 20, 10 Oh, 40, 30, 10, 20, 10 split. Um, it should be noted uh, that the aerial map attached doesn't accurately reflect the property boundaries and is intended for a visual aid only. Uh, the land management team recommends setting the price at the higher of the linear price of $15 per foot or the appraisal value. Uh, other options available are that council not sell it, which is not consistent with past practice and is not recommended, or um, that they not uh, require an appraisal, which is not recommended given that council has expressed concern that the city is not capitalizing on disposal of surplus property and an appraisal would ensure the best um, and fairest price for both the purchaser and the taxpayer. If anybody has any questions. Thank you. Um, what does committee want to do? We have the recommendation in front of us. Uh, Councillor Warren. Okay. Do we have anybody that wants... Mayor Elmsley. I'll make a motion as print. Do I have a seconder for that? Okay, Councillor Perry. So we'll go to questions. So Councillor Warren. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just wondering, my question would be, what's changed since 2011 to 2022 when the next uh, resolution was made. My, my concern is that we're losing uh, lake access and it may not be needed now, but it may be needed in the future. And it's like drip, 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 we're, we're, we're stopping all this uh, access. So my question to you, Sherry, is what, what's changed um, from 2011 to now? So through the deputy mayor to the councillor, upon the whole process that this went through, which uh, was laid out in the report, we determined that there isn't really very much access uh, through this through this particular piece of land. So um, the only access re results in people needing to use private roads to get there. Um, rather than so to try and access the property via Highway 35 isn't really feasible. So I guess nothing's really changed except for our understanding of that particular property. Are you good with that? So, no, through you. So in the future, could, could access be made available more easily from Highway 35? So through the deputy mayor to the councillor, it's my understanding that no, it, there's not a way to make it more accessible through there. Um, so it was looked at, at, we originally, so land management team originally thought that 
that access was required through there, but with everybody coming forward and speaking to the land management team, uh, we did realize that access isn't uh, available through there. And I'm not aware of any way to improve it in the future. Um, but I don't know what would be required in order to get access through there. To my understanding, no, it's not something that could be made available in the future. Um, it's just that there's a private road there. So I don't see how we would change anything to get access to it. It's a private road. So I don't know what would need to change. Thank you. So Councillor Perry. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And um, I just want to concur with uh, one of the statements of Ms. Dyer that as Ward Councillor, I have not had any feedback contact uh, about this issue. Councillor Joyce. Thank you, Madam Deputy uh, Mayor. And through you, um, Councillor Warren brought up some, a, a good point there in the drip drip. Is So two questions. Is there a nearby other area with lake access? And this, my second question is, how does the land management team determine that access is no longer required? So through the deputy councillor to the, to the, through the deputy mayor to the councillor, uh, there is an unopened road allowance beside the piece that we're selling. So conceivably somebody could get access there, but I don't think that keeping the road allowance we're trying to sell would would improve anything. I, th I think that the road allowance, the unopened road allowance beside it would be the way to get access if somebody was so inclined. And how does the land management team determine access is no longer required? So through the council, through the deputy mayor to the councilor, I'm not sure I understand your question. Okay, well, it was, what do you mean? How do we determine? It was determined back in 2011, I think it was required and has since been determined more recently that it's no longer required. And so I'm just wondering how that determination comes about. They changed their mind. So uh, I'm just curious how that process works. I can, uh, oh. I think Director Hawley wants to jump in on this. Uh, through the mayor to council. So um, I recall the subdivision um, because it took many years to get it through the through the approvals process. <clears throat> the, the access into the subdivision is a condo road. And the only reason that that was done that way was the Ministry of Transportation wouldn't accept a, a public road going into this into this development so it had to be a condo road and in their mind that's a commercial road and but a public road was not was not allowed through there my guess is that the Ministry of Transportation wouldn't allow the city to actually open up that road allowance to actually provide any sort of or any form of vehicular access down there because it's it's on a it's on a curve and it's and it's close to Blue Bay Lane, so um, and it's also a very heavily treed road allowance as well. It's very very dense thicket, so um, I think from that perspective, I'm not sure that that we would ever open that road allowance up, and I think the ministry would probably. Uh, probably have something to say about that as well just simply where it's located on on a on a corner and it's located very close to uh to blue bay lane as well so for your consideration thank you director holly yes thank you for that clarification uh, mayor elmsley would you like me to sum up if you would like to sum up just uh, a couple of things about this property. As has been pointed out, in order to access, get any access down there, you've got to go across private property. That's number one. The second thing is, if you wanted to access it, you'd have to park on Highway 35. And I, my experience with that is 
the ministry does not like anybody parking on 35. There is also access to water very close to Blue Bay, Blue Bay Lane. Uh, Parents Creek is not very far away. And I believe if you go over to Bayview, which is again, not very far away, there is also access through that. So I think this serves the homeowners well, and it also takes away a city's liability from people trying to access down there to the road allowance, and it ensures that the homeowners uh, have their rights protected as it is on a private road. So for those reasons, I'm in favor of uh, uh, moving the motion as printed. Thank you. Thank you for that sum up, and we do have a first and second um, recommendation as printed. So all in favor? And that's approved, thank you. Okay, we're moving to report 7.7, .7, proposed surplus declaration and sale of a portion of block 14, plan 608, city-owned property on Commerce Road. Again, Manager Dyer, thank you. So land management team received a request from the owner of land uh, legally described as part of lot nine on plan 608 in the geographical town of Lindsay, city of Kortha Lakes. Um, the subject property was vested in city ownership in 2005 due to tax arrears. The land management team reviewed the request at their meeting on September 12th, 2022 and had no objections. The team further felt that the portion of Commerce Road on Plan 608 should be offered to the applicant in order to straighten the lot line, given that the turnaround is no longer required by the city uh, because Commerce Road has been extended through to the subdivision located to the south of the subject property. Advertising occurred for three consecutive weeks in February of 2023. Realty services did not receive any concerns or comments. The land management team recommends that the subject property be declared surplus to municipal needs and approval be given in principle for the sale of the property um, subject to the adjoining landowner. A sub <laughs> yes, right, sorry. Uh, the land management team determined that the portion of the road allowance not required for municipal purposes and the interested party owns the property which borders the subject portion of the road allowance. The subject portion of the road allowance does not lead to water, borders private property, and therefore a stop up and close and conveyance would not contravene bylaw, section, bylaw 2018 020. Um, the remainder of the property adjacent is adjacent to a trail and land management team determined that the purchaser should be required to install a fence to delineate the private property from the trail property. Uh, and this condition would be included in the agreement of purchase and sale. Uh, bylaw 2018-020 requires one ap appraisal for a property that's not a road allowance to determine fair market value. Council can decide not to sell, um, but this is not recommended as it's inconsistent with past practice. Great, thank you. Um, so council, what would you like to do? You have the recommendation in front of you. Councillor Joyce? I move as printed. Councillor Smeaton? Second it. Do we have any questions at this time? Nope, okay then, all in favor? Good to go. Thank you, Manager Dyer. Seven reports and your, little, your team has been super busy, so thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to report 7.8, Affordable Housing Target Program Recommendations. Michelle Corley, Human Service Manager of Housing. Good afternoon, members of council. Um, through the city's affordable housing target program, the private developer MDM Developments is requesting various municipal incentives to support the development of 37 affordable units contained within their proposed 108 unit rental apartment building located in Lindsay at the location of 73 to 83 William Street North. The requested incentives before council within the report would largely be in the form of waiving of municipal fees. Through the Affordable Housing Target Program, 
council policy, proponents may request free waivers to support affordable housing. Additionally, the Affordable Housing Target Program Steering Committee has reviewed the request against this council policy and supports this request for council approval. Additionally, the city is aiming to provide rent supplement funding for a portion of these affordable units to allow two thirds to be deeply affordable to meet the needs of those with very low incomes. This annual rent supplement costs would be included in future operating budgets. And this report does not preclude this project from also following the separate and necessary planning and development processes. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, and any questions at this time? Councillor Smeaton. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, I have a few. Um, this particular building um, being mentioned is, is something of great interest to a lot of people. I know in Ward 5, uh, Councillor McDonald and I went to the original um, meeting that we had at Cambridge Street United in December, uh, which EcoView presented with uh, Bev Saunders, who will also be here tomorrow. And I just, I have, for me, um, this one is one of those really, really, really big uh, conversation pieces in the ward in terms of, you know, people have questions, everything from parking to schools. I mean, I'm, I'm aware the catchment area is Alexander, so there's no crossing the street at you. But a lot of people have a lot of questions. And um, I'm just wondering, I, I won't make a motion yet, but my, I'm wondering why this can't be or shouldn't be on the April Council of the Whole. My, my thoughts are, knowing that tomorrow's the public meeting with Mr. Hawley and with Bev uh, from EcoView, I would just have so much, I know I have, I won't name a number, but there are many interested people tomorrow at one o'clock that will either be here or through uh, Zoom watching the uh, PAC meeting and, and not with, with anything other in their sites than just they have questions and, and so they should. And um, I was really wondering if, if it could, is ever practice where I have that PAC meeting under my belt uh, tomorrow and therefore the question, a lot of questions answered and then something like this comes up in April. I just, for me and perhaps because, because I'm new, I find this a very cart before the horse uh, thing for me to tackle, but I'm sure I can see, I'm just seeking clarification on that first. So. Through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, to the Councillor. Um, so this process is usually handled very separately from the typical planning processes. They're in no way connected. Um, some proponents, such as this one, is they're actually anxiously waiting for some support towards these incentives because that actually allows them to move forward in seeking other um, federal programs for um, assistance with the financing of this project. And so if they don't meet certain milestones, then they're actually going to struggle to move the project forward. Um, so municipal, um, or sorry, I should say development is not always a clear, uh, follows a clear linear path. Um, so it is typically handled separately. Um, but I, I do wonder if there would be any comment on this in, from uh, CAO Taylor. Not to put him on the spot, but. And through you. You did a good job of it, through you, Chair. Um, I actually would agree wholeheartedly with the comments. In fact, I honestly recommend committee and council should separate the issues. Uh, what would be in front of you from a planning standpoint is building form. Um, so the project generally is a purpose-built rental facility uh, or development. Uh, this is very typical uh, of concurrent uh, sort of review and uh, would be strongly recommended from the city standpoint to help support the affordable housing program uh, that we're accomplishing or trying to accomplish sort of concurrent with these planning considerations that council has. So through you, Deputy Mayor, this What's being suggested by staff is, is saying to the constituents, which I represent, um, you're, you're saying keep the two separate, which I which I completely understand. Then the public will still be heard on as to whether or not this building itself in that location goes there. You're saying that's that's the recommendation here now is that that building is definitely in that location with this these parameters, or is this simply saying no? We're investing in. Th this type of housing and this would be we're, we're approving the budget concept that's where i'm trying to now i'm drawing my line because I, I you know i'm thinking of hundreds of people that have questions so sure through you chair um 
I think we're close uh, in terms of what's in front of you today is solely consideration for incentives for a particular housing form. Um, and it's typical sort of business. It's actually a prescribed program. Um, what is in front of you separate and distinct from a planning standpoint, or now you're wearing your planning approvals hats uh, ongoing, is the built form itself. And I actually not intimately uh, understanding of what the request is from the planning approval side of things versus what is already permitted under the zoning. Uh, but essentially the type of units and how they're funded, it's not a planning consideration if I can say it in simple terms. Um, that is why these are typically done concurrently. And uh, to the manager's uh, point, uh, separate and distinct, the overall project budget is reliant on some um, guidance or support for these incentives in order to move forward with their overall package. And through you, Deputy Mayor Luke, and I talked about that in December and January, the developer, uh, you know, the, this triggers this and this triggers that. So my final question would be putting this on hold for one month as is today is definitely going to hold back federal next federal next step federal next federal steps. Uh, through you, Chair. Um, I can't say for certainty, but my understanding is that this item is in front of the CMHC for sort of supportive funding, and I suspect they're looking for local support, at least for the funding uh, component to it, which is why it was brought forward uh, at this time. Thank you. And Councillor Warren? I talked to Michelle this morning and uh, I had some of those, some questions and uh, um, I think it's really important that we move forward um, with this. So in that vein, I will make uh, the, resol I'll, I'll move the resolution as printed. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Mayor Elmsley. Did if, you want to get a seconder first? Absolutely, and then, if you want And then I'll, I'll comment, thank okay. you. Do I have a seconder to Councillor Warrens at this time? Is that Councillor Yo? Yes, okay. So we have, uh, so we're still good for questions. Go ahead, Mayor Elmsley. Thank, thank you, it's not so much a question. <clears throat> I did talk to the principal at MDM and he was very concerned because he has timelines for his financing to continue. I also feel that affordable housing is something that we have made a priority and we have very challenging goals that we, uh, that the province is requiring us to meet within 10 years. And now with interest rates where they are and the problems building housing as we go forward, uh, we know that the housing corporation is now looking at its model on how it it builds uh, affordable housing, and we have two on the books: one in Fenland Falls and one in Minden. Uh, that one of those may be in jeopardy because of um, financing and because of the economy. So having a private partner come in who is front-ending this and going to provide affordable housing helps our numbers immeasurably. So I think, it's, I, I think it's a very good project and we're still going to have to go through all of the planning processes to ensure that everything is done appropriately. So I, I certainly am in support of uh, um, giving them the incentives they need. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McDonald. Uh, yes, uh, through you, uh, uh, Deputy Chair. Um, I just want to review Mr. Smeaton's comment. So we're going to develop, we're going to give $591,000 um, through financing to this company. What Mr. Smeaton is saying is that he's, we, we all got hired to speak for the people and, and people have spoke to him. And I, and I, I know we need housing more than any, anybody. I sit on the committee. So, um, but I think it's important that we build the right houses in the right area. And 
I think we have to listen to the people before we ju- jump and 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 say we're going to give all this money out. And by doing that, you pretty well said that it's already approved, but and you haven't listened to the people yet. So um, I, I can't see thirty days or uh, a, a month or two is going to stop this project. But I, I think more information should be gathered. Um, due respect to Mr. Smeaton's people that he has to represent. Um, and that's my comment on that. So uh, I think uh, I think he needs a chance. Okay, Councillor Joyce. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. And through you, uh, first uh, a, a comment and then a question. Um, in respect to uh, Councillor McDonald and, and Sweetener, I've worked with the CMHC, not directly through my work with Habitat for Humanity for six years. And if there's a deadline, it's a deadline. <laughs> they don't mess around. Um, so that's my comment. My question is is on the financing. I'm in support of for, for affordable ha- housing. And in the past, is this the same or similar type of financing we've done for affordable housing with waiving the fees and the development charges coming from the con- contingency reserve? For you, Madam Deputy Mayor, to the Councillor. So yes, this is consistent, although it's been a very long time since we've actually had a private developer wanting to do affordable housing. That being said, we do have a very detailed council policy that outlines the types of incentives that proponents can seek when building affordable housing. And we do um, also apply a sliding scale. So the more incentives one might require or require requests, um, the longer we want to see those units be affordable for and things like that. Um, we do put agreements in place to ensure that we are uh, monitoring and, and they continue to remain accountable to providing affordable units throughout the whole term. Um, so yes, yeah, certainly very consistent to what we've seen with other projects. I do understand that annually there is money put aside um, to offset development charges for builds like this. Um, I don't believe we accessed any last year. And I believe there's approximately 300,000 um, put into the reserve this year. That being said, and I'm not the subject matter expert on this, but likely by the time this project reaches um, the point of obtaining their building permit. Usually, I believe that's also tied to the requirement to pay development charges. Likely, the full implementation of Bill 23 will come into play, thus actually making development charges being, um, they will be waived as of right for the affordable units such as this. Um, So actually, potentially in the next few months, um, that requirement that we're forced to do now as far as recovering any waived development charges will no longer be required. So we may not even need to do that transfer to offset that incentive for development charges uh, because we do know that this is going to be changing momentarily. Great answer. Thank you. Well, can I just have the CAO? He just wants to clarify. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you. So um, what is in front of you is is applying the incentives in table one. The second recommendation is not to waive the development charges, but how to fund that waiving. Your council policy on development charges already waives DCs for affordable housing units. So that's already there. You don't need to decide that. What you're deciding is how we're accounting for it uh, moving forward. So just wanted to make that clarification. The other applications and incentives in table one are though for you to approve uh, as part of the package in front of you today. Great, thank you. Councillor Perry. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy Mayor. And I wanna thank uh, Ms. Corley for her thorough uh, presentation. Uh, I wanna echo the remarks. I think Muskoka DNM should be uh, lauded here for their commitment to building affordable housing as a developer. Uh, In my math, which isn't always great, this is over 35% of units will be affordable housing units, including deep affordability. Um, My question though, if I could have put a clarification for under Councillor Smeaton's point, my understanding is what this will do today, and we still, it's still only committee of the whole, so there'll be another couple of weeks, is it would specify that if this build goes to the planning process, these units will be allocated as part of it. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. CEO. 
Sorry. Through you, uh, Madam Chair, that is correct. Great, thank you. Thank you, and uh, Councillor Smeaton for a second time. Thanks to your Deputy Mayor. I just want to clarify a couple of things. Um, number one, I want to make sure no one here is saying that Ward 5 people have spoken against this location. They haven't spoken. That's what I'm saying. Because they're curious about many, many things. Many of these people, by the way, uh, that I've had conversations and lunches with three days ago are people who think it's an absolutely fantastic location. They still have questions. So this is not a uh, Councillor Smeaton affordable housing issue whatsoever in any way, shape, or form. It's a question about a building location that has specific allocations and people have questions. And that's what I was elected for, was to guarantee them that I would ask those questions and guarantee them that they would have a chance to poke their nose around, ask some questions, and then let me know what they think. That hasn't happened. That's all I'm saying. Affordable goals, affordable housing goals, 100% on my radar. These tables... Absolutely phenomenal put together, exactly what we want to see for affordable housing goals. I'm saying table it for a month. That's all I'm saying. Get the information, at, get questions starting tomorrow that I can bring back to council at the end of this month, and then we take a peek at this. And the last thing I'll say is I'm in full support. Uh, the wording was uh, giving the, uh, the incentives they need, as am I. I'm, I'm every single thing, I can echo every sentiment at this table myself, but I want to make sure that I'm also including conversations from hundreds of people that are very, very curious and they have questions. And just so that I'll finish by saying that it has nothing to do with affordable housing, which I'll very easily prove three and a half years from now, when I'm advocating left, right, and center, it's about a location. That's it. I'm, I'm just looking for public input. And so that it's not an affordable housing, here's one tiny example. Parking. Is it going to be underground parking? Is it going to be around the corner parking? Is it going to tie in with widening roads here? There's a lot of questions that have nothing to do with a political ideological issue. They're just questions that I would love to know the answers to before we say that's a great spot for that building. That's all I'm saying. Thanks. Thank you. And I, Councilor McDonald, your hand is up. Do you still? No, sorry. Never. I put it. I never put it down. <laughs> no problem. So, Councilor Warren. Want yep. me to sum up? We have a motion on the table, so yes, yes if yeah. you'd like to sum up. Yeah, we're, we're not approving this uh, today. Um, tomorrow, um, we can, all those people can come to planning and voice their concerns. It's just getting the process going. And I have, I have questions too about parking and all the various things. So I think it's two separate um, issues. And uh, um, I, I can see how um, you would look at it and it, it's kind of melding together, but I think it really is two separate issues and we got to get the process going. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to tomorrow and listening to the public and uh, I hope you will support this uh, motion today. Thank you. Thank you, and I see no other um, questions at this time. Just for um, housekeeping's sake, um, we need to identify the proponent on page 179. So um, it's the that report HS2023-003, Affordable Housing Target Program, be received that the subject to the necessary bylaw and municipal housing facilities agreement with Muskoka MDM Development Project on 73 Willow Street North being forwarded to council for approval. So that's the amendment is we didn't identify the proponent in there. So is that fine? Okay, so we have a, a we have a first and second and uh, all in favor? One, two, one, two, three, four, five. That, okay, we, that, and that passes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to report 7.9, Children's Service Access and Inclusion Expansion Program, Janine Mitchell, Manager, Human Services. Uh, yes, thank you for the opportunity to come and, um, and bring this for report forward. The report is to provide an update on where we are with the Canada-Wide Learning and Early Learning and Child Care Agreement, or CWELC for short. We do love our acronyms, which is an agreement between the federal and provincial governments, which was, um, which was implemented in April 2021. The intent of CWELC is to reduce childcare fees for eligible families, increase access to high quality, inclusive childcare for all children, zero to five, and to invest in the early learning and childcare workforce. 
The vision for Seawell concludes making childcare more affordable. All of our service providers opt to participate in CWELC and therefore receive funding to offset their daily childcare rates. And the result is that families saw a reduction of 50% in their ch daily childcare rates for childcare children of children 0 to 5 as of December 31st, 2021. Additionally, as part of the plan, the CWELC provides funding to support the creation of new childcare spaces. And the city has been allocated a total of 443 spaces. There was a typo, typo in the report, I realized. It's 443 spaces, 49 of which will be created directly in a school and with this, in partnership with the school board, and 394, which will be created in the community. This report provides the rationaliz rationalization and the plan for the expansion in both the city of Porth Lakes and the county of Halliburton. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. So we uh, thank you, committee. What would you like to do? We have the recommendation of the report in front of us at this time. Councillor, I mean, Mayor Elmsley. Thank you. I'll move it as printed. Do I have a second? Councillor Perry. Okay. And question, questions at this time? Well, I have one. <laughs> um, it's, it's, a, it's a great announcement to have that coming to our communities. And I know I, I've spoken to you in the past because, you know, when we're looking at some of our outlying communities, there's priorities out there. You know, there's, there's some communities that are in need now. Um, I think one of our hurdles, though, is our, our current rural zoning bylaw. And if we don't have it finished yet, so that's going to create some, some hiccups in the process of finding allocations. I don't know if you want to um, make a, a, a statement regarding that, just so we have a better understanding. Absolutely. So the, the current bylaws restricts the number of children that can be cared for in a licensed home child care. Not all of our spaces are going to be allocated towards licensed home child care, but that expansion is a really key part of this because that's going to help us reach communities that don't have access to, to care. And we have about, I think it's about 80, place, 80 spaces planned for growth in licensed home child care. So it will affect it. And reducing what happens when you reduce the number of, of children that are allowed to be cared for in a home, it reduces the potential income that a home child care provider could make. And that reduces the, um, um, the financial viability for that person to provide that care. The Early Learning and Child Care Act stipulates the number of children that can be cared for in a home. So, uh, unfortunately, our bylaw provides further restrictions from that. And the bylaw itself never met and never agreed with any of the acts that were in place. It was always lower than what the acts allowed. And it restricts us to four children in a home. And under the Early Learning and Child Care Act, we're allowed to have six children in a home. We are working. We have been in contact with Leah Berry about the process to get that bylaw changed so that we can not put that additional barrier um, for licensed home child care providers. Thank you through that. And that's exactly where I was going is we just have to break down that barrier because those two additional children per home um, really adds up and it's going to help, you know, take some of the pressures off on some of these smaller communities that are looking right now for uh, childcare. So we do have a first and second. So all in favor and that's passed. Thank you very much. So we're going to report 7.10. It's proposed heritage designation of 932 Highway 7 Geographic Township of Mariposa. Emily, um, you've got a few of them coming back based on the presentation earlier today. So just give us a quick overview, if you don't mind. Sure. Thanks, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. So um, just with regard to 7.10, uh, 7, 11, 12, and 13, um, these are all heritage designations coming out of the Bill 23 amendments, and all four of them are city-owned properties. Um, so it was decided uh, in discussions with staff that we would uh, prioritize um, designating city-owned properties, not because they had a risk of demolition or redevelopment, um, but to show leadership um, in our heritage programming. We don't want to be uh, directing other people to designate their properties when we're not willing to designate ours. Um, so the first of these properties 
is the Oakwood Library, um, which has some heritage value as an early 20th century uh, rural schoolhouse. Uh, the second is, sorry, I'm just, just checking to see what order they're in, uh, 16 Bolsover Road, which is the Bolsover Community Center. Once again, it's a former schoolhouse, which has now been converted into a community center. Um, the next is 15 Balsam Lake Drive, which is St. Thomas uh, Anglican Church, or the former St. Thomas Anglican Church, as well as the Associated Cemetery. Um, and then the last one, oh, hold on. Sorry, I'm just looking at the, oh, there we go, sorry. Um, the last one, I was misreading the agenda there. <laughs> the last one, uh, 713, is uh, 1474 Highway 7A, which is the Bethany Library, um, and it was the former Manvers Township Hall. Great, thank you. So we do have a recommendation in front of us. What does council want to do? Councilor Smeaton. Make a motion to receive as printed. Okay. Do I have a seconder? Councilor Perry. Any questions at this time? Councilor Smeaton. I'll just say really briefly uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, that this is going to make a lot of people happy that are friends of mine. I'm thinking of, I wanted to say this publicly, this was also the TMR school at one time, and Bruce Peck was the principal. Uh, I know the Pecks right now, and uh, I think of Boyd and Susan Young who met there. I could go on and on, but that, sco that, that school, they did as an EA and a teacher, so just a, there's a lot of special memories, and they'll be just thrilled that this is a heritage landmark. Uh, Mayor Elmsley? Are we approving all four? Are we moving all four? Or are we doing one at a time? No, we have to do them separately. Thank you. So, all in favor? And that's approved. Okay, we'll move on to a 7 um, 11 proposed heritage designation of 16 Balsilver Road, Geographic Township of Elton. Are you giving us an update on that one, or? Is not all inclusive. I think we're I think good, right? You did them all, all four, didn't you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but if anyone has any specific questions, I'll just uh, stick around to answer those. Perfect. So all I need right now is um, what does staff um, council want to do at this time? Okay. Mayor Elmsley? As printed. Seconder? Councillor Warren? Any questions? Don't see any. All in favor? And that's passed. Move to 712, proposed heritage designation of 15 Balsam Lake Drive, Geographic Township of Bexley. We've just had the overview. What does council want to do uh, with the recommendation in front of us? Councillor Perry. Move as printed. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Joyce. Any questions at this time? I don't see any, so all in favor? And that's passed. Which am I? So we'll move on to, which one am I on? 713, okay. uh, report proposed heritage designation of 16 so it's, Balsam. It's a, it's a misprint. Oh, it's a it's misprint. This one here. Okay. So it's uh, 713, the report uh, ED 2023 009, proposed heritage designation of 1474 Highway 7A, geographic township of Manvers be received. What does count? So we'll want to do with the recommendation in front of you. Councillor Joyce. Move is printed. Councillor Yo. That means second? Yes, second, yeah. Okay. Do I have any questions at this time? Don't see any. All in favor? And that's passed. Okay, we're moving into report. After this report, we'll have a quick 10 minute break before we go into uh, committee updates. So uh, report 714, 2022 landfill, Lindsay Ops landfill gas generator summary, uh, David Kerr, manager of environmental services. And we have Director Robinson. Thank you, uh, through you, uh, Deputy Mayor to Council. This is just a very brief up update on the, the status of the Landfill gas generator uh, to uh, previous council were uh, requested bring uh, annual reports to council on the status of that generator. Uh, through the report, you can see that the generator had some significant challenges through uh, the past year, uh, primarily related to uh, the uh, electrical component and work related to the capital project that's ongoing. 
Uh, that is being resolved as we speak right now, so we're anticipating back to regular operations uh, moving forward. Uh, if there's any questions, we're willing to take them. Okay, um, we have the recommendation in front of us on this report. What does council want to do? Uh, Councillor Warren. Okay, moved by yourself, seconded by Councillor Smeaton, and go ahead, Councillor Warren, with your question. Yes, through you, uh, Madam Deputy Chair, Mayor. <laughs> All of that. <laughs> Chair Mayor. Chair Mayor, Madam yeah. Deputy Chair Mayor. Yeah, through you anyway, um, to uh, uh, Director Robinson. Um, on page three of six, um, it talks about, um, well, I guess my question is that, that the cost of this is coming out of the user rates. Is that, is, I, I read that in the, the uh, yeah, so that's, well, so. Uh, let me clarify, okay. okay, through through the Deputy Mayor to yourself and to Council and whole, uh, uh, the project was initially a tax-based project. It was installed. Uh, the Council at the time, uh, uh, well, again, the, the project, the energy from the project, so the energy generated by the generator, is going to offset costs at the wastewater treatment plant. So Council at the time wanted to allocate costs based on the proportionate uh, amount of hydro used by the landfill versus the amount of proportion of hydro used by uh, the uh, the wastewater treatment plant itself. So that percentage has been uh, imposed, uh, reviewed on an annual basis, and that's how those costs are allocated out. It was the direction of council, resolution from council. Thank you, Councillor What's Joyce. Oh, oh I'm not, no, sorry. go ahead. So, yeah. Follow up. If yeah, sorry. Um, so when was that? Was that many years ago? Because I remember, is this the same generator that we, that back in, gosh, no, and that uh, we, we uh, bought and that has always been a bit of a problem? Is it the same same uh, generator? Uh, through uh, Deputy Mayor, th this is the same generator. We've only ever had one, it was purchased, it wasn't installed initially, it was uh, then commissioned and has been running ever since. Uh, again, the first few years of operation, the bigger challenge was the amount of available uh, gas to uh, actually feed the generator to keep it running. We've been working with the engineering yeah. department to install additional gas collection system uh, so that we can properly feed the amount of gas into the generator that's needed. Um, but again, the, the challenges this year weren't related to that, it was related to downtime in conjunction with the capital project that was happening. Okay, thank you. Councillor Joyce. Thank you, De uh, Deputy. <laughs> thank you, Deputy Mayor, and through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, that's the word I was missing, sorry. I think it's a long day. <laughs> um, and to Director Robertson, I just, Trying to read this, go through this report here. Budgeted two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Is that an annual cost? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, to the Councillor, uh, the uh, we issue an, a contract for operational maintenance, repair, and general life cycle uh, maintenance, and so on. Uh, that contract typically is around the two hundred and forty two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year to operate that facility on our behalf. And going through the, the numbers here, and thank you, Councillor Warren, because I needed that assistance. Are we making money or not? Because your numbers are all in paragraphs. Was, can you line it up? Is there a pro uh, the P&L? <laughs> through you, Mr. Or through our Deputy Mayor, to the Councillor. Uh, apologies. The uh, uh, again, the the on a typical year, last year it was break even, actually slight profitable. Uh, in this particular year, uh, we were not. Uh, we were down 122 days out of, uh, out of the year uh, from running an operation, so that uh, the costs associated with the, you know, the operation maintenance and so on did not offset. So it was a net loss through last year, uh, again, with rationale. But going forward, it'll be possibly net zero, small loss, small profit. It's more or less a net zero going ahead. Yep, through you, Deputy Mayor. We do uh, anticipate uh, in the in the green, uh, black, so to speak, moving forward, uh, as long as we can keep uh, that uh, electrical issue uh, at bay. And one more question: What's in terms of life cycle? What's the uh, 
estimated life for this generator before it's kaput and we have to replace it with possibly a more efficient generator? Um, to you, Deputy Mayor, I don't have that information off the top of my head, but I would imagine a typical life cycle for one of these is around the 20 year mark. Um, we're not there yet. Uh, there will be life cycle rebuilds and remanufactures throughout that life cycle. So we'll, uh, again, we'll work with the, uh, the asset management group, make sure that we have that plans in place. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see no other questions. We have a first with Council Warren or second with Councillor Smeaton. All in favor? And that's passed. Okay, guys, it's 435. We'll be back at 445. Just a quick 10 minute uh, stretch.
here momentarily. And we're back. Okay, gang, so we're just going to quickly go through our um, committee reviews and work plans for 2023. I, at this time, I do want to thank all our committees, um, and we're excited to see where we're going in 2023 as new council. So I'm just going to ask each um, councillor just to give a quick, brief update um, of each one, and then we'll move as the recommendation. So first up is 715, uh, Miscible Heritage Committee 222 Review and 2023 Work Plan, and we have Councillor Ashmore. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, this has been a very busy group. Um, our Manager of Heritage Planning, um, Emily Turner, was with us today and went over so many things here that we're, we're doing. Uh, just, I'll just give you a quick synopsis here of what they're planning for, what they've done in 2022 and what they're planning for 2023. Process applications for designation, um, a lot of recommendations to council, um, recommending properties uh, for listing to council. One of the things also was to make sure that, and I brought this up at the committee, was to make sure that the public would be informed if their property would be um, listed. So we're going to make sure we, we made it a, a priority that the public would be informed and that's priority number one of properties that would be listed. Um, so we're doing a lot of work with that. Um, coordinating events like Doors Open which is a really popular event and that's um, started again this year so sort of like an open house of about half a dozen different locations in Kawartha Lakes that you can visit so that coordinate doors open is back um, the Osprey Heritage Awards um, the Old Mill Heritage Conservation De District Development we're working on that um, in the Lindsay uh, area in, in downtown Lindsay or in, in the Old Mill District um, looking at other things like Scugog River as culturally not just buildings but um, um, natural natural features like trees and and waterways as historical cultural heritage landscapes as as designated uh historic so that's another sort of a branch that we're getting into and as emily mentioned we're, we're going over the heritage inventory we have a huge heritage inventory and uh, that's a mammoth undertaking in itself so and um, so basically there's lots of work to be done on the heritage committee it's a good group and we're working hard there and uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ashmore. Great update. Uh, do you move the recommendation as printed? I'll move as printed. And do I have a seconder? Councillor Joyce? I have a question. Okay, well, second. I'll just, who's, do I, I'll get a seconder first. Yeah. Seconder for uh, the rec, Councillor Smeaton. Okay, Councillor Joyce? Oh, yep. Thank you. And uh, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, it, it, with Emily's pre previous pre presentation a month ago at the other um, uh, committee meeting we had of the whole here, I had a great sidebar conversation with her. There was, you know, we talked about in, Indigenous heritage and I asked her if, if that was, you know, going to be, um, uh, remain a focus of, of the committee. And she said, I, I hope I'm not misquoting her, she said absolutely yes. But I don't see that word indigenous in the 2023 work plan. I don't think we have her on any longer, do we? Do you want to see? Do we? Oh, we do. we do. Okay, there you go. Thank you, Emily. Uh, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, yes. Um, the We haven't specifically mentioned indigenous um, issues within the, uh, the work plan uh, because there's there's some areas that touch on different um, Indigenous items, um, but also many of our First Nations consultation um, issues are dealt with outside of the scope of the Municipal Heritage Committee. Um, so for example, we have our, our various scope of consultation, repatriation, education, um, and land acknowledgement policies, um, which are actually directed through our, um, our legal services um, department through, um, uh, through Robin Carlson. Um, and then some of the consultation that's done, it goes through me, but it's related to our capital projects. 
So the, the scope of undertaking work with Indigenous communities and working on those partnerships and doing consultations, it's spread across a whole range of municipal departments, and it's not necessarily a, a core function of the Municipal Heritage Committee. Thank you for the answer, but with all due respect, I, I, and it's up to the committee, but in my personal opinion, I think it should be in your draft work plan. Thank you. The word, you know, some, some effort towards the Indigenous uh, um, cultural heritage landscape. Councillor Ashmore. At the beginning of each meeting, um, the chair has a land acknowledgement, uh, quite a lengthy land, land acknowledgement, which is at the beginning of each. I know that's, that's important, but um, we, we did discuss it and I'm sure it'll be incorporated into the, into the process in the next year. It'll, it'll be brought up again. I'll bring that to the committee. Thank you for that. Okay, so we have a mover and a seconder. So all in favor? And that's passed. 716, Kawartha Lakes Park Advisory Committee Annual Update in 2023 Work Plan and Councilor McDonald. Yes, uh, thank you through Madam Deputy Chair. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, start off with that. Our first meeting is on March 20th, so it's a new committee. So this will be uh, educate us all. So just a couple of things, quick uh, things I want to bring up. That last council submitted a letter to council requesting the uh, the city to investigate opportunity to create an additional off leash dog areas in Lindsay. Council referred back to staff to follow up on Q2 2023. <coughs> Excuse me. And they also submitted a letter to council requesting the city investigate opportunities to support increased winter use in parks and on trails by plowing parking areas adjacent to various parks and trails. Council referred that back to staff to follow up on Q2 uh, 2023. So in the uh, upcoming year, the committee will continue with the following, discuss major park uh, developments and continue maintenance of the existing parks, provide a formula for citizens and user groups and community agencies to raise issues and concerns regarding municipal parks, and continue to provide and guide the city council through the community service department on matters pertaining to policies, development, conversation, active uh, transportation, practice and programs related to municipal parks as required. And I'm sure the new council or the new uh, committee and anything else that we find that's important to, uh, to do in 2023. Um, that's just a quick uh, synopsis of everything. This is a volunteer advisory committee. There's no financial or operation impact. So keep that in mind. And I'm sure the past committee has done a great job and I look forward to and working with everybody in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor McDonald. And do you move the recommendation? I do. Do I have a seconder? Councilor Smeaton, all in favor? And that's passed. 717, Kawartha Lake Cemetery Board 2022 Work Summary and 2023 Work Plan, Councilor Yo. Thank you, uh, and through you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, Cemetery Board for 2022 was was um, it was good to get everybody back together. We got our decoration days back after after COVID shut them down. Um, it was really good to get back out in the community and and because the cemeteries mean so much to the community. You want to talk about heritage and history? Um, it, it it literally lies in the, in the cemetery. It's just just a plethora of information and and um, and a place that the community holds next to their heart. Um, this year, there is actually, I'd like to invite council and congratulate you all on being um, the new cemetery board because there are actually no members of the cemetery board except me. And uh, and that being said, uh, council takes up the, uh, the throne and we are at the cemetery board this year. So we will support Patricia Wikes as she carries on the day-to-day -day operations with her staff. She does a tremendous job. She does it, um, the operations, the internments, uh, she looks after the decoration days and um, she just, she does it all. Her and her staff are just wonderful people and they work so hard. And so this year they're looking at different cemeteries and storage, um, how they can store soils and equipment and just doing some general uh, planning for the, the future of the cemeteries. So, so congratulations, council, welcome on board. Thank you for that. And uh, will you move the recommendation as printed? I will. And do I have a seconder? Mayor, Mayor Elmsley, all in favor? And that's passed. 
718 Finland Landfill Public Review Committee 2022 Work Summary and 2023 Work Plan, Councillor Perry. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, the committee has met a couple of times as it was staffed through our resolutions um, late last year. Uh, there are uh, a few issues that are being dealt with, and uh, other than that, not a lot to report. Well, thanks very much. So you'll move the recommendation? I sure will. And do I have a seconder? Councillor Warren, no questions. All in favor? And that's approved. 719, Lindsay Ops Landfill Public Review Committee 2022 Work Summary and 2023 Work Plan. Councillor Smeaton. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. Through you, I, I like the, the Councillor Perry approach. That was pretty quick. Um, I won't get away with that one quite, quite as easy. Um, I, I will say, first of all, that to have former Councillor Robertson, uh, Chris Appleton, and uh, Mr. Kerr, David Kerr, uh, and to sit on a committee that a lot of people would say landfill. Um, you're talking about three amazing people. Uh, David Kerr, I, I think the word brilliant isn't an understatement. I, I'll, I'll leave that with the people who know him better than me, but it's a really, really great committee and it also has representation from the public, which is always a great, great committee. And you can imagine all the conversations that are happening. We've only had two meetings since I've been involved and the first was more of a meet and greet, but even right from the beginning, obviously this is a big issue for the future. A lot of conversations about what's going to happen next. Uh, Provincial initiatives obviously at the forefront with recycling and all the different things that are happening there. Uh, as uh, Director Robertson, you know, one came up today referring to certain infrastructure and the infrastructural needs of a, of a current landfill. It's a big, big deal, right? I mean, this is a huge landfill and an amazingly well run. I've, I have really kind of geeked out, to be perfectly honest. I, I, I've been fascinated by this committee far more than I ever thought I would. So kudos to everybody. I have a lot to learn. Therefore, similarly, not that much to report to, or I'm going to look, you know, well, the guy only had one meeting and that's the truth, but I've been very impressed. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Councillors Meaton. I'm a keener too. love landfill. Um, so will you move the recommendation? Yeah, uh, I'll move it as printed. Thanks. And do I have a seconder? Councillor Perry, I don't see any questions. All in favor? And that's passed. Moving on to 20, 7.20, Waste Management Advert, what time is it? <laughs> waste Management at, uh, Committee 2022 Work Summary and 2023 Work Plan, and Councillor Warren. Yes, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Here we go. Um, yeah, this is a, a an exciting committee, lots happening um, with the expansion of the landfill and uh, source separated organics possibly going forward and even maybe energy from waste but uh, um, down the line um, something to look at so really excited on all the the changes um, I'm I'm really I'm glad to be back on uh, this committee but I will just uh, um, tell you some of the things that happened I guess I've got them here um, in 2022, so um, report uh, to Council on Corporate Waste Vision, report to Council on Public Consultation for Future Waste Options. Um, they promoted uh, Bulky Plastics uh, Pilot Project and uh, changes to Mattress Program. Uh, continue reaching out to marinas and farmers regarding recycling options for boat and bale wrap. Um, complete requests for expression of interest for the source separated organics program. Um, report to Council on Capital Improvement Study completed by Engineering and Corporate Assets. So that's, I guess, that's the expansion. Um, con uh, continue increasing CND diversion and mattress diversion. Work with other departments on improvements of public space and recycling, which is good to get uh, uh, that in-house and make sure we're doing the right thing before we ask the public to do things. So, um, and start planning how to implement corporate waste reduction vision procedures. So that goes with that. So I think I'll move that. Great, thank, thank you. you. And a seconder, Councillor Joyce. Any questions? Okay, nope, all in favor? And that's approved. Okay, moving to 721, Cortha Lakes Accessibility Advisory Committee 2022 Work Summary and 2023 Work Plan. Councillor McDonald. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Chair.
we just lost him, so why don't we if, see if he comes back on. We'll go to 20, uh, 722, which is the Environmental Advisory Committee 2022 Work Summary and 2023 Work Plan, and that's Councillor Warren. Okay. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, lots of lots has happened and is happening with the Environmental Advisory Committee. Um, I've come off uh, eight years of being chair and uh, handed it over to uh, Deb Pearson, who's going to do a fabulous job, and Ginny Collings. Um, so. Um, really, we've got a great committee, and uh, we're, we've done all sorts of really exciting uh, initiatives, like the EV uh, test drive uh, uh, last last summer, and we're hoping that will again um, through plug and drive. Uh, that that's going to be a a, a fun uh, initiative. Um, we have B City, which is under the Environmental Advisory Committee, and we're doing all sorts of different uh, initiatives. We're hoping to have a uh, walk by uh, um, garden tour in in the the north of uh, uh, I guess not north, but b around Bond Street. If if anybody's walked there in the spring and summer, the, so many of the gardens there have been um, just turned into pollinator gardens. It, and so we thought, wouldn't that be great to have a walk-by uh, pollinator garden tour? So that whole area, they've really started to get the idea of doing that, so that's wonderful. Um, we've got a transportation um, subcommittee uh, under Jamie Morris and doing amazing things there. Um, so I really, I'm really uh, looking forward to working with this great group of people, so I'll move the recommendation, thank you. Thank you, and do I have a seconder? Mayor Elmsley, and I will agree. I was four years on as uh, on CLIAC as well, and it was a really great group, So, and it's nice to see what you guys are up to. So uh, if no questions, all in favor, and that passes. Okay, we're gonna skip back to 721 because I believe we have Christine Briggs, IDEA partner online to give us the update on the Cortha Lakes Accessibility Advisory Committee. So over to you, Christine. Hi there, thank you Madam Deputy Mayor and through you to Council. Um, since Councillor McDonald has left us, I'll give a brief update on his behalf. So as per our appointments on February 21st, 2023, we officially have a membership of nine individuals on the Kortha Lakes Accessibility Advisory Committee. And per the legislation, more than 50% of our members do identify as people with disabilities. We held our first meeting on February 23rd, 2023, and we were able to outline some key priorities moving ahead. Um, the goal of this dedicated group is always, you know, first and foremost, to identify and eliminate barriers to accessibility. Um, to tackle this objective, the committee has opted to once again split into two working groups, and that is our public spaces working group and our public awareness group. Now, in 2022, we emerged from the pandemic restrictions, improved public spaces was top of mind, and we saw a number of projects in this realm come to fruition, uh, including completion of the work on our downtown streetscapes in Lindsay and in Fenland Falls, um, continued work on the Bob Cajun Beach Park, and a number of upgrades suggested to the Manvers Community Center, including accessible washrooms and elevators. So as we look forward to 2023, a large focus will be on planning by way of our new accessibility master plan, um, an evaluation of our strategic priorities, and then ultimately defining the action items for the next four years. So. We'll be prioritizing outreach as always, education, continued consultations in an effort to reduce barriers. Um, part of that outreach, I'm going to use this quickly, um, is for this year's Accessibility Awards. So it's going to be in person for the first time in a number of years, and that is our focus until those nominations close on March 24th. So on that note, I'll turn it over to you if you have any questions. Thank you, Christine. That's a great update. I see we have Council McDonald back on. Would you like to move the recommendation? Yeah, I, I don't know what happened there. I hit a I hit a button somewhere and went off, but uh, 
I was going to try to, to sum it all up, which he might have already uh, said it was that I just wanted to uh, to make sure that what we want to really do is enhance the accessibility for our residents, and we want to uh, work with the community building our, our our community and give everybody an equal opportunity to live, to visit, raise a family, and work and retire by identifying and removing all and preventing barriers for individuals and all the abilities. Uh, that's kind of the whole the whole thing and all of one kind of one kind of sentence. <coughs> well, thank you. And do I, I have a seconder? Mayor Elmsley, no other questions, all in favor? And that's approved. <coughs> uh, 723, Agriculture Development Advisory Committee, 2022 work summary and 2023 work plan. Councilor Ashmore. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. And um, we have a, um, a full roster on our Agricultural Development Advisory Committee. Um, some of the things that we're working on, uh, last year we had a successful year. Um, and the VIP tour is one of the things that we, we, uh, we put together every year. Uh, it's a tour of uh, various agribusinesses. Um, and uh, just to point out that agriculture has a hundred in this municipality has $175 million in sales. And there are 12,000 people who are employed through agriculture, either directly or indirectly, indirectly um, through agriculture. So that's quite a significant employer in City Court of the Lakes. Um, we're also working, um, trying to um, make sure that we get the, the, the rural zoning bylaw done right. Um, because that's really affects a lot of agricultural operations and decisions. Um, the East Central Farm Show, there was uh, there was another successful year. We, we, we many of us here were in, in attendance there, and um, it was probably the biggest show that they've ever had, and the first in show in person show in about three years, I guess. Um, we're also working on a partnership with Fleming College uh, with um, heavy equipment operating. With the there was a simulator um, that was there at the. Um, Farm show this year, so that was great. Uh, we're doing a partnership with uh, with that and uh, Kelly Maloney, our our um, uh, manager of agricultural uh, development, was there and explained that to everybody at the booth there. And finally, next year we'll be uh, getting ready for the international plowing match and and uh, rural expo. So we'll be expecting around a hundred thousand people come visit here, and I'll be in. Um, Dufferin County to uh, for the 2023 um, plowing match, which will be in um, third week of September. Next, on, in 2024, it'll be in the end of August. That's when the dates are going to be, uh, but that's going to be in August instead of instead of October. So it should be good weather. So we're looking forward to that. Thank you. Great, thank you. And you want to remove the recommendation? I'll move that. Thanks. And a seconder, Councillor Perry. Oh, we have a uh, question by our Mayor Elmsley. Um, through you to Councillor Ashmore, <clears throat> there's another plowing match taking place, I think in Woodville in September. Um, would you care to, to speak, August, could you speak to that, please? Okay, that, that was the one in um, this coming year? Yeah, there there is one. Um, and we'll be, you know, I certainly encourage people to come to that. So it's always a good one. It's by, it's by the local plowing association. So um, the the international plowing match and rural expo, it's it's run by the uh, the group in Guelph. Uh, but this one here coming up in Woodville, it's it's a, it's the local association, and they put on great shows. So um, I'd encourage people to attend that this summer. Thanks. Thank you, and we have a mover and a second, so all in favor, and that passes. Uh, report 7.24, Kortha Lakes Airport Advisory Committee 2022 Work Summary and 2023 20, Work Plan, Councillor Perry. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and um, building on the brevity of my, my most recent report, um, of course, just a, a few lines, uh, we all know that the uh, the airport here is a not, not just a cool feature to have an airport in Lindsay, but it's also an important asset, both economically and in terms of the community benefits here. Um, it's really taken off uh -huh. in the past uh, several years, yeah, yeah, generating a profit, uh, thanks to the capable management and interventions of uh, Director Rojas especially. And um, it really brings jobs and supports businesses and customers and suppliers, uh, making things more accessible. Uh, here in Kawartha Lakes. Uh, last year, 
uh, there was a good volume of traffic through the airport, um, including um, fly-ins from Trillium Aviators, South River Flying Club, uh, the 99s, and a number of other groups. And if you don't want to wear a fly-in, is, is like a gathering of airplanes that comes in and uh, almost has like a, a conference, but a really fun one, you know, on the runway in the surrounding community. Um, as you know, for, also in the last, uh, for this year, there are a lot more uh, new group tours uh, being scheduled, events and orientations. It's a good opportunity for the public. There'll be more public outreach for the public to engage with the uh, aviation and to know the, the benefits of the local airport here in Lindsay. Uh, in 2023, as you know, we just passed the capital plan, so there'll be um, some more enhancement to the airport terminal and an updated business plan uh, to outline potential needs, especially as we want to maximize land use, but also uh, preparing infrastructure for growth. And I'm honored to serve on that committee as the councillor appointee. Uh, councillor Smeaton has the airport in his, his ward, so we work together. And Craig, the uh, manager there, has been outstanding. I also want to thank uh, Lisa Piemann for my remarks today. Thank you. Thank you. And would you like to move the recommendation? Yes, I would. Thank you. And do I have a seconder? Councillor Smeaton? No questions. All in favor? And that's passed. Okay, we're hopping along here. So memorandums, uh, 8.1, memorandum regarding a water usage alert system. Councillor Smeaton. Thanks through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I'll be brief and, and quick. I'm just looking for uh, support to push this to council. Um, We've, we've, and again, uh, former Councillor Vale today is, is uh, the fifth since I've been on council. Just different people who have um, odd metering uh, or odd bills that just seem really significantly out of whack. I'm not, this isn't, you know, about, this didn't come from the odd person who's worried about their bill. But some of these really, really strange, holy cow, we have this and that, and they've done everything they can. Um, I just wondered if there might be some sort of a system as we're building infrastructure and we're building uh, broadband and all these different things with water uh, meter replacements. I could read the actual memorandum if, if you'd like, um, but I'm happy to just speak this way too, if that's okay. Um, and it came to my attention from a, a physician in town who had had a situation. I can read through the documents, but I, I'll see if I get a seconder and I can do that if need be, where it was just brought to the attention, what if we had something similar to what a bank fraud department has. So all of a sudden there's a really bizarre anomaly and you get a phone call, which I've had happen twice in my life from CIBC. And they're like, man, that does not match your particular spending pattern. So you get the phone call and you can call and you know that in fact wasn't us. Okay, we'll cancel the payment. And these things are becoming, you know, each meeting we have someone who had a, a very strange anomaly in their water usage. And Peterborough had a program where um, it's, if you sign up for the paperless, you get a weekly reading and it comes back saying that you, in fact, have had a very strange um, bill. It looks something like this. So it shows you that this week you were using three cubic meters, and then all of a sudden it's 21 this week. So you actually get that in your email, and it, send, it sends to your email that this week you've had a very, very odd something happening. So if you're a doctor and you're like, okay, that's really strange. I've had a plumber in and I've done all this work and everything's strange. That doesn't make any sense. We're not doing anything different. You're kind of alerted ahead of time as opposed to finding out on your water bill. That's the basic idea. And uh, just looking for this coming through council with a little more conversation at the end of the month, a chance to talk to, to staff and, and just see if there's ideas out there that might be something to attach ourselves to some of the, the new initiatives that are coming with new water metering and all those kinds of things. So that's the general idea. Councillor Warren. Okay, is there any other questions at this time? Then, um, oh, Councillor Warren. I just wanted to say not just the bill too, it yeah. actually saves water, Yeah. right? So it, it, yeah, nips it in the bud and so you know what's going on. Thank you for bringing that forward. I will just say quickly, it's interesting that the individual, I didn't want to talk too much, but the individual who brought the idea forward originally, and then there was many, was from the eco angle, actually. They were more concerned that they were just, you know, using too much and, and weren't aware. So, Thank you. And so all in favor? And that's passed. Okay, the next two memorandums are mine, and I can speak to it, but then I will need a first and second to move forward. Um, the first one is 8.2 regarding a pulverized road request on Ballyduff Road, west of Highway 35 to Mamber Skugai Line and on Slalom Way. Um, the reason I'm bringing this is um, I have a few roads in Ward 8 that are becoming absolute operational burdens. Um, the roads are done 
and I'm, I'm looking to say, can we not save some operational costs? You know, we've had to hire in contractors just to just to fill holes because these roads have deteriorated so much. Um, I also want to mention that these routes were being used as illegal haul routes. So they're not built to sustain that type of traffic, so they've really accelerated with damage. And that's why it's been something that you know, I've been watching, listening to my residents, and I'm just looking to staff to see if there's that, uh, you know, that angle that we can pulverize to save some operational costs and, and, you know, and maybe release some of the burden on public works, you know, so they can spend other time doing other projects that are very necessary at the same time of the year. So uh, I'm just looking for a first and seconder so I can get some information back from staff. Okay, uh, we got Councillor Warren and Councillor Perry, so all in favor, and thank you. Uh, 8.3 is my memorandum regarding rural resurfacing, resurfacing within the Janetville subdivision. And I'm bringing this back because uh, I did bring it as a memo back on March 9th, 2021. And uh, we're to a point where it's, it's nothing has been addressed right now. And I know we've been through the pandemic and we've got, you know, we've got a pre, you know, we've had to change our work plan. And I totally agree with that. The problem with the Janetville subdivision is back in, um, 2009, they actually did a tar and chip, which is a, in a hamlet village area, and it's just not sustained. Um, I grew up in that area. It's on a marsh. Um, in 2014, we did change the policy that hamlet and villages had to go back to that uh, resurfacing with asphalt. So at this time, I'm just looking to you know get a plan. How do we tackle the Janetville subdivision? Because there's not much left. I know the roads are deteriorated, the crown's gone, and you know even possibility of you know looking at the lifestyle cycle you know extension program where we tackle one road per year so we can actually catch up. So that's why I'm bringing it now. It's just that. I did flag it two years ago, and it's getting to the point right now where you know the tar and chip is just not holding up in the subdivision. So if I can get a first and second, and that would be Councillor Smeaton, uh, Mayor Elmsley, and all in favor, thank you, and that passes. So here we are at the end of this huge agenda, just reminding everybody to uh, reach out to all the amazing women and girls in your life tomorrow, and uh, give them a big applause and a big hug. And I'm looking for an adjournment uh, to a oh. three minutes. Three minutes. I'm no. <laughs> um, so I will say if I can have a first. Oh, Emmett Yo, and the seconder, Darla McDonald, and all in favor. We're out of here. Well done.